in the mighty and wonderful name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Yes. I have an idea. I have an idea. Amen. Amen. For our first, for our first part of our fellowship to be a, a reading of scripture. A reading of scripture. Amen. We read the scripture and then uh, discuss it before we go to the next topic. A, a scripture on marriage. Karashom? Right? Amen. Amen. Today's reading, today's reading is in uh, Genesis chapter chapter one. verse 24 up to Genesis chapter 2 verse 25. Right? And we are going to take turns to read. Is everybody having a Bible over there? Where you are? Amen, I have one here. Amen, yes, please, we do have. Good. Uh, who was the other one? Was that Veronica? Pastor Martha is also there. Yes, amen. Amen. Pastor Martha is also there. Pastor Maita? I do have, please. Great. Uh, so we're starting from chapter one of Genesis, verse 24. And we'll go all the way to Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. So someone read Amen. Someone read Genesis chapter 1 from verse 24 to 31. Until to which chapter? Until Genesis 20, chapter 2, verse 25. So for now, somebody will read from Genesis chapter 1, verse 24, all the way to verse 31. I mean, let me read mm -hmm. the, uh, chapter 1, Genesis, verse 24, yes. until 31. Mm -hmm. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, the livestock, the creatures, and they move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, and the livestock according to their kind, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kind, and to God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The God say, then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. 
they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and, and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant to, for food and it was so. God saw all the God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Amen. 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 Can, can somebody read from uh, chapter 2, verse 1 to 7? Can somebody read from uh, chapter 2, verse 1 to 7? Another person from uh, verse 8 to 17, and then the other person to finish off. 18 to 25. Verse 1 to 7, who can read for us? I hope you'll Amen. be able to Amen. All right, great. Sister Angie, welcome. We are doing a, we are reading a passage of scripture from Genesis chapter 1, verse 24 to Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. Pastor Martha has just finished uh, reading chapter 1 from verse 24 to verse um. 31. Now we're in chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 7. Somebody will read. Ma'am. Chapter 2 verse, verse 1 to 7. Mm -hmm. okay, the Bible says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth. And no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one going, no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Amen. Uh, somebody read from verse uh, 8 to 17. Amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. I'm reading. I'm reading from verse 8. From, no. from verse 8 to 17. Mm -hmm. Now the Lord God had planted, plant, planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord God made all the kind of trees grow out of the garden. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden, there were a tree of life and a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. The liver watering the garden flowed from, the, from Eden. 
from where it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It weeds through the entire land of Havira, where the, the, there is gold. The gold of that land is good, aromatic, resin, and onyx are there also there. The name of the second liver is Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Kush. The name of the third liver is Tigris. It runs along the east side of the Ush Asher. And the fourth liver is Ephratus. Ephratus. Then the Lord, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you, you, you are free to eat from the, any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will suddenly die. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And somebody to read from uh, verse 18 all the way to the end. Somebody to read from verse 18 to the end. Amen. Let me read. Amen. Verse 18 until uh, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Genesis 2.18. It's also on the screen. Those on the screen, you can read from the screen. Are you still there? Are you still there, Sister Vero? Amen. Oh, I thought there's, there's someone reading. Oh, verse 18. It reads in the name of Jesus. Amen. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bed of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever, and whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the beds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept and he took one of his rings and closed up the flesh in, in its place. Then the, the rib which the Lord, the Lord God had taken from men, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of, a, out of men. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Vero. Very powerful. Amen. Yes. Uh, Sister Angie, can you hear us? Can you hear us over there in British Columbia? Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Amen. I can hear you. Great. Blessed senior. Amen. Senior Bishop. Wonderful. Yes, you found we have just started. Um, 
we have a new procedure now. We start with the um, scripture reading, Bible reading plan. And then uh, we discuss this scripture. And then after that, we go into the different topics. Amen. Right. So what is the Lord teaching us in this passage of scripture that we have just read? From Genesis chapter 1, verse 24, all the way to Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. What is the Lord teaching us here? So this is our fellowship. We discuss, we deliberate together. We learn together. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You can you can you can comment on any scripture there. You don't have to start from verse 24. Just any scripture there. What is the Lord teaching you from this scripture? Mm, praise the Lord. Amen. Uh I think I just want to start with Genesis chapter one. All right. Uh, from the verse uh, 24 where we started. Mm -hmm. um, this is just telling us about God's creation mm -hmm. uh, when uh, he created. And we can see already that uh, uh, in verse 24, the one we started with, God spoke a word and, uh, and it, it all came into existence, what he spoke. Mm -hmm. And so let the... Uh, let the uh, uh, God said, let uh, let the land produce living creature according to their their kind in yeah. their livestock, in the creature. So they all came to being as uh, he called them out. So that's just that verse is just telling me that uh, it's what I learned that God, um, when he created, he spoke a word and they all came to being. Mm -hmm. And it's also telling us about the God's creation and. Um, how he created them and the, in the order of his creation. Amen. Amen. You, you, could, you could also say that another observation there is that whereas God commanded the creatures into being and commanded the trees into being and commanded the water into being and commanded the light into being, what else? And commanded the animals, yes, the, the, the sea mm. swarming creatures into being, the creeping things into being, the flying mm -hmm. things into being, the mountains into being. But when it came to Adam and Eve, he said, let That's us right. make. Let so us make took, the Trinity. The set. He took a special care, special attention to form the man, Adam, the red one of the earth and his wife. He took time to, he slowed down and reached down to the dust of the earth to form them with his hands. That's quite peculiar, isn't it? It is. Yes. Amen. Indeed. Uh, yes. I'm saying indeed it's true. They it took time, they all said, you know, just to the sit and just to so that a man can be created. Mm -hmm. yeah. And not just to be created, but to be created in the image of God, yeah. in his likeness, in his yeah. image and likeness. Very unique. Very unique even Very from the way he created the angels. Yes. Amen. Uh, who Amen. else wants to chip in there? Is that Sister Martha? You want to chip in? Uh, not really, just to give more emphasis on chapter yeah. 1, verse 24, mm -hmm. that when God has done created everything, he saw that everything was good. Mm -hmm. So there is no other additional needed to be made by any human being. Yeah. So everything was beautiful in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. So, Amen. yeah. Amen. Indeed. Uh, who else wants to add up there? Uh, James, you're welcome. Welcome, welcome, James Okello. Um, 
Brother Afel, you're welcome. Sister Justina, you're welcome. Susan Bugwa, you are most welcome. So we are discussing this passage of scripture we just read, Genesis chapter 1 from verse 24 to Genesis chapter 2 verse 25. What is the Lord teaching us here? It's a blessing. I hope people can hear me. Eh? Sister yes, Blessing. Yes, Sister we can Angie. Hear you. Amen. Sister Angie, would you like to add anything here? Would you like to contribute? Um not not at this moment, please. Um I am still listening in and uh, I shall contribute as we go along. Thank you. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you. Uh-huh. Anybody else there? Sister Veronica? Amen. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add anything here? Contribute anything here? Yeah. Mm, I also wanted to say, uh, what I wanted to say is what Sister Martha said. You s just say it, just say it. Because you, <laughs> no, one, no one can say it the way you say it. Amen. In, in verse 30, 31 of chapter 1, that uh -huh. when the scripture says that, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Mm. Uh, meaning the Lord, everything that the Lord has created is, is wonderful. Yes. So there's, there's no one who can change or say that, no, what the Lord has created is not good, it's not wonderful, it's not looking good, so let me change it, let me add or let me take. So mm. everything that was made is indeed wonderful and good in his sight. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's nothing you can do or change. Amen. So he did, not make a, he did not make a mistake. Yeah. He did not make a mistake with no. the way he created us, with the way he created the heavens and the earth. No, everything was wonderful and it was created perfectly. Amen. That reminds me of uh, Psalm, Psalm, is that Psalm 139? Is that one Psalm 139? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and that my soul knows very well. Yeah, is that is that Psalm 139? 139. Yeah. Yes. Fearfully and wonderfully made by God, and that my soul knows very well. But sometimes we tend to forget, isn't it? Okay. Especially ladies, they tend to forget. Especially sisters tend to forget <laughs> that, that's true. Uh, <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> identity crisis, eh? You forget that the Lord has made us in His perfect image, in His perfect likeness. He did not make a mistake with us. Mm, where, where is that scripture? I think it's someone. Aha, verse 13, Psalm 139, 13 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. But sometimes we forget. Sometimes we act as if we don't know full well that the Lord has created us wonderfully and fearfully. There's no mistake. So when you look at your nose in the mirror, even though you think it looks big, it was well made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. So God did not make a mistake with you or with me. Somebody say you have a long occiput, you have a long... Uh, Occiput, you have big eyes, you have whatever. You are wonderfully made in the image of God. No mistake. So nobody should make us feel insecure or cause us to have identity crisis because of their uh, miscalculated uh, criticisms. <laughs> Amen. 
Sometimes they are well calculated to cause insecurity in us. But the Lord made everything well, including marriage. So you see there now, um, in Genesis chapter, chapter 1, there he said, So God made mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. We know that the image of God is holy, is a holy and a righteous image. Male and female, he created them. Is a glorious image. Is a perfect image. And uh, so in that state, men and women, Adam and Eve had the glory of God upon them. Amen. And, and that is the goal of our living here on earth, that we may carry on, bear the image of God, that we may reflect the image of God in our lives and in everything that we do. And that also factors in marriage. Therein goes the calling of marriage, of, of marriage relationships, that we may bear the image of God, that we may bear the likeness of God in our marriage relationships. Marriage exists only for the Lord and not for anything else. Amen. Nothing more. Marriage exists for God. Our lives exist for God. Even as we, as we prepare for the future, as we pray for the Lord to bring us uh, um, the men and the women that he has for our lives, that he has in store for us, that he has planned for us to get married to, the goal is that we may bear the image of God, that we may bring glory to God. Amen. That we may bring glory to the Lord. Now, if you go to uh, chapter 2, verse, um, verse 22, let's say, let, let's, let's start from verse 18 to, to 22 there. So he says, it is not, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. I will make a suitable, um, I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground. Wait. Uh, can you all see my screen? I can see. It. Yes, please. Yes, please, Professor Bishop. Okay, good. All right, so now the Lord God had formed, okay, I'm here, verse um, 18. For the, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the bears of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man, so the man gave names to all the livestock, birds in the sky and all the wild animals but for adam no suitable helper was found so the lord god caused the man to fall into a deep sleep and while he was sleeping he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh then the lord god made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man the man said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of me, of, out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Hallelujah. Uh, someone is struggling to connect, yeah? Yeah, I'll put it up on Telegram. Okay. So what you see there, the Lord is saying that it is not good for the man to be alone. He needs a helper. I will make him a helper. I found out that this word helper suitable for him means somebody who suitable means can fellowship with him. Somebody that can stand in his presence. Uh, helper 
means somebody that can restrain him, a restrainer. The word that is translated helper is the word for restrainer, helper, succor. Yeah. Then the question becomes, why does a man need a restrainer? Maybe you people can help me with that. <laughs> <laughs> why does the Lord say, I will make him a helper, a restrainer? Why? Pastor Saki, welcome. Why do you need to be restrained? Oh, Brother Jacob, you are here. Why do you... <laughs> you be reckless. Careful. Huh? Careless? You say men can be careless, eh? Mm, maybe men can be careless. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they need to be on the leash. <laughs> Mr. Meke, what do you say? Why does... Why do the brothers need to be restrained? <laughs> Mm. You're struggling, eh? Stretching your head, eh? Stretch your head and give us an answer, please. Why do the brothers need to be restrained? Why does the Lord say, I will make him a... I will make him a helper? Yes, helper, 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 but the other side of that is restrainer. Why? Why a restrainer? What is the job of the restrainer? Uh, yes, think... Brother Samuel. Praise the Lord. Oh. Amen. You, you just wait to over here, Jacob. Brother Samuel will jump in and then I will get back to you. Yes, Brother Samuel. Uh, okay, from my view. Yes. And uh, how I'm under understanding it. Yeah. Basically, this one will will help a man to achieve whatever he wants in life. For instance, let's say for example, mm -hmm. that you want somebody who can encourage you maybe to pray, mm -hmm. who can encourage you in the service of the Lord. And the opposite of that one, you may find that many men, they will not be able to organize themselves alone. I think that's all. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for your contribution. Yes, Overseer Jacob, what were you saying? Okay. Yeah, uh, it's almost the same. Uh, I think God had a purpose for men, kind of. Uh, he needed his uh, objective to be achieved and I uh, believe it's one of the reasons that uh, God had to create the... Um, a helper in order to help this man to achieve uh, his goal. Um, Whose goal? Uh, the goal of creation, the purpose of creation, okay. of God's creation. Mm -hmm. And also to, uh, like uh, Brother Samuel was saying, it's also to to help someone, you know, to, to, to achieve the goal in order to, um, to reach the goal that they have set up. Okay. And, yeah. Yeah, that's just contribution. Okay, what about Brother James? You Same. What are you saying, Brother James? Hello. Okay, Brother James is on holiday. Yes, Overseer Saki. Amen. Praise the Lord, uh, Blessed Senior Bishop. Amen, you're most welcome. Thank you, thank you. And I uh, greet the whole priesthood in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, I see, I see restrainer as Bishop, uh, senior Bishop asked the question restrainer. I believe, yes, you know, for like for, for us men, or, or let me say, some of us men, uh, we have no breaks when it comes to certain things, uh -huh. so like a few things. So, a woman, um, with their femininity, with their feminine touch, mm. uh, can help us or pre help us prevent doing some, some wrong things or uh, what help us from um, yeah basically from doing wrong things <laughs> uh, that's how I see <laughs> that's how I see on uh, or see fit as a restrainer coming in you know or maybe uh, during times of conflict even they have uh, that, that magic touch uh -huh. to soothe us 
in our times of anger probably mm -hmm. uh, just to soothe us or to soften us mm -hmm. compared to when it's another man when it's just a world full of men i believe we would have just been uh, chaotic <laughs> that is my uh, my contribution on the restrainer you say the man will not be able to restrain another man <laughs> Uh, yeah, probably, but it might be tough uh, <laughs> strategically. <laughs> I see. I see. Uh, we have a lot of people joining us uh, that have just joined us. Uh, you're most welcome, Susan Elizabeth. Uh, who else is here? Um, Susan Elizabeth, uh, Nathan Patrick. Uh, um, who else joined us recently? Yeah, you're welcome, blessed people. Yes, sister, it's a blessing. Your hand was up. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. Please. Yes, please, Bishop. Uh, I just wanted to talk about the restrainer. Yes. In such a way that uh, it's so important because sometimes you may uh, reach a point you want to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And if there is no one there to, like, you can have a mind together, then you help each other. So that is uh, a restrainer and it's mostly in, in making decisions mm -hmm. so that you come to a good point. You, if you're alone, you may make mistakes and mm -hmm. make decisions that are not appropriate. But if a woman is there, then he can give your mind and he can restrain you sometimes not to do bad, good, evil things and also when you are making a decision. Amen. To apply some bricks. To restrain him in some decisions. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Oh, Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that uh, contribution. Brother James Okello, are you ready to speak now? James Okello, are you ready to speak now? You ready? Okay, maybe not. Welcome, Day Adeline. Uh, you are found, we, have, we are reading from uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 24 to Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. And um, I brought up this issue of uh, the Lord saying that let, it is not good for the man to be alone. Let us make, <clears throat> he said, I'll make him a helper suitable for him. And I uh, said, this word helper in the Hebrew is the word azar. Ezer. Some say azar, some say azar. And the, the definition there is succor, uh, restrainer. Uh, helper. And uh, my question was, why does a man need a restrainer? Why do the brothers need to be restrained? And we had... Mama Bishop have an idea and she wants to share. She say men are generally more risk takers and women are generally more cautious. Women are more cautious than, than the men are. Uh -huh. So the woman may need So the woman may need to restrain the man if he's going to make an unwise financial decision or some risky uh, decision that may mean a matter of life and death. <laughs> Amen. Very true, very true. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Have you seen some brothers' bedrooms? <laughs> some single brothers. <laughs> Have you seen some single brother's bedroom? They look like pig sty. <laughs> Isn't it? Uh, some brothers, they never take, learn to take responsibility. Yeah, there, Sister Justina said to, to share the responsibility. Some brothers, they never learn to take responsibility until a woman comes into their life and begins to make them straight. Yeah, Brother James, you can join via Telegram. On Telegram, there is uh, audio, and you'll also be able to contribute straight from Telegram. So if you can join on Telegram, you're welcome. I'll send the link here. I'll send the listener link here. All right. So, so we agree the man needs a restrainer, correct? So, sisters, what do you think about being a restrainer? 
What are your ideas on the role of restrainer? <laughs> or your your being a, a, a restrainer, you think about marriage. I think let's yes. say bishop. Yes. Uh, men are, are rush. Can I say they rush to, to do things? Uh -huh. There should be someone to put him to to to, to control him. Because you can rush to do things which may may lead to harm. They are saying they may rush into things and so they will need you, the brother will need you to slow him down, eh? Yes. Powerful. Very powerful. And that becomes a very powerful way of fellowship. So you can see, in, a, in other words, you can also see the differences between men and women, yeah? And how we are supposed to be complementing each other and how our differences are supposed to be working towards um, bringing glory to the Lord. And uh, now look at this. How our differences are supposed to work towards the fellowship that God wants to achieve in the oneness of marriage. Yeah, Because here now there's the, 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 the word suitable helper. It's a helper suitable. Suitable here now is the word. Um, when you look at it, it essentially means Fellowship, to fellowship, one that can stand in the presence of here, yeah, suitable, meaning one able to stand in the presence of, meaning somebody that can fellowship with him. Somebody that can fellowship with him. So he created the woman to be able to fellowship with Adam, if to be able to fellowship with Adam. And uh, and you see that he did not bring the chicken to fellowship with him. He did not bring the donkey to fellowship with him. He did not bring the dog to fellowship with him. So all other things were disqualified from this powerful role of fellowship. Hallelujah. From this powerful role of fellowship between the man and the woman in holy matrimony. Now, let us talk about this fellowship. This fellowship. Uh, in fact, uh, when you put these two together, look at this. When you put these two help, help us suitable together, the Lord saw that Adam, the man, would need some restraining, isn't it? He saw that the man would need some help, some succor, some strengthener, somebody who can bolster him, <laughs> restrain him from his foolishness. Uh, there's a pastor that makes a joke out of uh, one scripture. There's a scripture there that says, women live with your own, uh, live at peace with your own husbands. Somebody said, that, that word there of uh, your own husband, the word there is, your own is the, the Greek word for idiosyncrasy. The word idiosyncrasy means your own self, of self. Amen. But it is also the same word. It is also the same word that is defined that we use. It is the same word from where we derive the word idiot. Amen. And so the scripture they saying, wives, live with your own husband, meaning live with your idiot husbands. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Say submit, submit to your own husbands. In other words, submit to your idiot husbands. <laughs> Some, somebody's you like, Bishop, what are you teaching us? Eh? You see the role you have to play. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, a man can be quite, um, they can be quite idiotic at times, yeah? Semi Kiprotich, somebody has joined us, welcome. Sister Pea, welcome from Mashakati. Yes. So, so we have this fellowship now the Lord is talking about. A helper suitable, a, a restrainer who can fellowship with him. And now I was saying that when you look at this helper suitable, so the Lord saw that Adam would need help. The man would need help. Let me see. Who's the... Okay, we have that brother, Feresiano, would need help. 
<laughs> would need to be restrained. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. The Bible says it loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> that over here, Jacob would need to be restrained. Who else is here? James or Carol would need to be restrained. And in providing that help, in, in supplying that help, in manifesting that help, the Lord now created the woman. Hallelujah. And so, in other words, you could say, the woman, let's see here, you could say, Sister Meke, is God's help in the flesh. Hallelujah. Sister Martha Amen. is God's help, meaning God has decided to come and help somebody. And then Amen. his help now is called Sister Martha. <laughs> Sister Angie. That is God's help. <laughs> Sister Esther Blessing. In fact, this, this is the same word that is used when you hear the Bible says, you know, when the Bible talks about God coming to rescue his people, God coming to help his people. It's the same word here, in the, the same Hebrew word here, azar, ezer. And so you see the sisters are God's help in the flesh, God's help clothed in flesh and blood. Very powerful, eh? Very. <laughs> very, very much powerful. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, now there is a big problem. When we get married, the man, the man sees the, the, the man because of his short sightedness, he, he begins to see many problems rather than seeing God's help in the flesh. Brothers, you need you need to be you need a lot of help. Huh? You need God to open your eyes so you see the help that God is providing. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. God's help manifested in the flesh. Very powerful. We have to appreciate our sisters. That's God's help in the flesh right now. Brother Eiffel says, now, amen, now I see marriage differently. Amen. amen. <laughs> Very mighty. God's help in the flesh. So, sisters, tell us, please, what do you think that it means to be God's help in the flesh? Scratch your head. Let something come out from here. Sister Maker, you are there. Sister Mother, you are there. What do you think it means to be God's help in the flesh? Maybe it's your first time to hear about this, eh? Yes, please, it's your first time. <laughs> Okay, let us explore. Let us explore together. <clears throat> Sister Angie, I hope you're still there. What does it, Sister Esther Blessing, Sister Veronica, what does it mean to be God's help in the flesh? Now your newfound role. Now, now you are learning about your, your roles. Eh? <laughs> what do you think it means to be God's own help in the flesh? Yes, Sister Angie, you have a thumbs up there. I give you the microphone. Pastor Susan Elizabeth, you are most welcome. We are discussing. Amen, that. amen. Amen. Yes, please. Thank you, Senior Bishop. You're picking on me. Amen. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I was agreeing with you that yes, we are helpers. Amen. Okay. Um, um, having given it, it a bit of thought, um, my my thoughts are that the man. As the, as the Lord God created the man, he is a powerful individual who has the capability to be able to, to think you know, broadly and want to perhaps um, you know, like involve or indulge himself in different kinds of things you know, in, 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 able, in order for him to be able to um, develop further. But, as he thinks or as he wants to con continue himself further, um, he also has different shortfalls. And he's, the, the, the man is um, an individual who can easily just uh, get into involved with um, 
various kinds of decisions without giving a second thought to it. So that's where the woman comes in to be able to contain him yes. so that this man can have a second thought. Mm -hmm. And um, the woman is there to be able to, to um, give him, like the way you can say you have uh, speed bumps. Mm -hmm. So he, he the woman gives, yeah, the woman gives him that op opportunity to slow mm -hmm. down and reflect and think twice and say, okay, um, these are the ideas that I have. But um, if I if I just went quickly, probably he would have an accident or he'd he'd have a shortfall in uh, and he would regret. So the Lord has created the woman to be able to contain him, to mm -hmm. be able to restrain him, to be able to give him um, a second thought mm -hmm. or um, an opportunity to, to, to deliberate and to figure out if truly the decision he has made is going to be of war of value or, mm -hmm. or worthy to mm -hmm. his family, because for him being with her, they're already two. Mm -hmm. They've come together as one and they're making a family. So whatever the decision that he makes, mm -hmm. it should be restrained or given a, a second thought so yeah. that the it's so that it can be in union for the glory of god Amen. and um that is, that is the the way i see it and okay on the second part if i could just um elaborate it and yeah. and how it it creates um issues in the family is that without you reading the bible and ensuring that you can be able to understand this verse with that sort of clarity. That's the reason why you find that a lot of men and women in their families have mm -hmm. a lot of arguments because the man just does not understand what uh, the role of the woman to mm -hmm. be able to contain him, to be able to restrain him or, or give him that, um, that effect of being a speed bump, you know, yes. he uh, hesitate. Mm -hmm. wait a minute let's just figure this out together like is this really right and then the man starts saying you woman you're just standing there and you, you, you're trying to um block the my uh, you're trying to oppose against mm -hmm. my decisions yeah. so <laughs> the man as powerful as he is he doesn't see the value of being uh, restrained or being given an opportunity by God's creation of, of the woman to, to um, make him think twice. Yes. Shalom, that is my thought. Amen. Very powerful, very deep indeed. And, uh, and, and you make me, and you, and, and, and you provoke me to realize that indeed, as, as God has, uh, has given the men the leadership, you know, as God has called the men to be the head and the woman, <clears throat> the body as Christ is the head and the church is the body, and uh, so the, that restraining and that help is to ensure that the thoughts, the plans, the purposes, the goals that the men um, uh, run towards, that they are right, that they are clear, that they are right. Amen. That he does not end up wandering into the bushes and getting lost in some uh, fantasies. So he has God's help right there. God's help of righteousness in a woman. Very powerful. Pastor Silas, you're welcome. Yes, it has been a long time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, blessed Senior Bishop. I'm really happy to be part of this after going off for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm really learning. I've just joined, but I got some slight information. So I'm still listening. I know. Maybe I'll wait. Thank you, blessed senior bishop. Happy to be You're here. Welcome. Amen. 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 Uh, Sister Meke, what about you? What do you think? Sister Angie went very deep and uh, expounded very powerfully there. Uh, Sister Meke, what are your thoughts on your, call, your calling as God's help in the flesh? Amen. Blessed senior bishop. Yes. I have just a very short contribution. Mm -hmm. I think as a wife, yes. 
we are expected to serve our husbands, the husband, and submit to the to our husbands and to take care of the family. That's it in short. Amen. Thank you so much. Submit, take care of. Remember, there's also the ruling part. He eh? said, let them have dominion. So, so the Lord has also commanded the men and the women to rule and have dominion together. Yeah? Where is that scripture? Is that in chapter 1? Let them have dominion. Okay, we'll, get, we'll go to let them have dominion. Let's talk about, let's finish this part of, uh, let's finish this part of being a helper. Suitable, God's help in the flesh. Sister is the blessing. Pastor Susan, yes please, yes, please. What are your thoughts on that? On being the God's help in the flesh that is suitable to fellowship. God, rather I than I think, yeah, it's he is he because the woman becomes the help in every aspect of, of, of the life of a man mm -hmm. in order to to maintain the God's perfection in creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he made everything perfect, and so uh, becoming a helper in many things in every aspect of life, then and, and it 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 actually brings out the image of God and the purpose. That's why God created marriage. Amen. Amen. It brings out God's purpose, God's plans. And, uh, and, 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 and things would have been messy indeed if, this, if, the help, if the help in the flesh was not there. Pastor Susan Elizabeth, did you want to say something? Hallelujah, blessed uh, Senior Bishop. Um, sorry, I didn't want to say anything. I'm just enjoying the teaching. Ah. I'm not saying anything now, please. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Amen. Uh, Thank you. You are most welcome to contribute if ever possible. Only then. Amen. Sister Maker said, uh, as a wife, she's expected to serve. Yes. Submit to her husband. Amen. Family. Amen. Yes, please. That's uh, Veronica. Yes, I just wanted to uh, give my opinions also regarding the uh, our expectations as, as God's help in the flesh. Is yes. that one? Yes. Yes, I was just thinking that maybe uh, for us, we are expected to, to play a godly role in marriages. Mm -hmm. uh, for us to, compl to, to complement the, our husband in, in marriage, mm -hmm. for, for instance, maybe to, to be a prayerful woman, mm -hmm. to teach your children about the word of God, to fast and pray, for your husband, just to play a godly role in, in your marriage. Amen. Amen. Very powerful. To play a godly role in marriage. Very powerful. When you say that, you remind me of the man called Nabal. Is it Nabal? Let's look at one man that needed to be restrained. <laughs> you guys remember the man that called Nabal? Hallelujah. Do you know do you remember a man called Nabal? Yes, Bishop. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 25. Somebody will read for us here. It's it's a long one, but uh, I think it's worth reading. I think this is now a practical example of the, of this of the restraining now. <laughs> We have, uh, we have the example of uh, Nabal, or Nabal, however you call him. Nabal, 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 whatever. Even David. David also needed some restraining, isn't it? <laughs> Not only did David need some restraining, but also Moses needed some restraining. We'll look at them. Let us read um, 1 Samuel 25. Who can read for us First Samuel 
Can I read in a bishop? Am I able yes. to read? Yes, yes, yes. One? Just read from verse one until uh, you tell me to stop. Until I say stop. Yeah, you can invite someone to help you to read the whole scripture. Okay, okay. I'm reading uh, from Amplified Version. Uh -huh. And the Bible says, Now Samuel died, and all the Israelites assembled and mourned for him and buried him at his house in Ramah. <clears throat> David arose and went to the wilderness of Paran. A very rich man was in uh, Maon, whose uh, possessions and business were in uh, Carmel. He had 30,000 sheep, a thousand goats, and he was sharing his, his sheep in, 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 in Carmel. Mm. Uh, the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding, beautiful, uh, but the man was rough and evil in his doings. He was a calibite. David had in the David had in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing the sheep. And David sent out 10 young men and said to them, Go up to Carmel to Nabal and greet him in my name. And salute him. Thus, peace be to you, to your house, and to all that you have. I have heard that you have uh, you have shared us, and now your shepherds have been with us, and we did we, we did them no harm. They missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Uh, therefore, let my young men find favor in your sight, for we come at an opportune time. I pray you, give whatever you have at hand and to your servants and to your son David. Verse 9 says, And when David's young men came, they said, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, then post. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who are each breaking away from his master. Shall I then take my bread and water and meat that I have killed for my sharers and give it to men when I do not know uh, where they belong? So David's young men turned away and came and told him all that was said. And David said to, to his men, every man guard on, his, guard on his sword, and they did so. And David also guided on his sword. And they went up after David, about 400 men, 200 remained with the garbage. But one of the Nabal's young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed at them. But David's men were very good to us and were not harmed, nor did we miss anything as long as we went with them when we were in the fields. Verse 16 says, they were, uh, they were a wall to us in night and day, and all the time we were with them keeping the sheep. So know this and consider what you will do, for evil is determined against our master and all his house, for he is such a wicked man that cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, and five measures of parched grain, a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs, and laid them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal. As she rode on her donkey, she came down, uh, she came down hidden by the mountain and behold, David and his men came down opposite her and she met them. Now David had said, surely in vain, I have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that not so that nothing was missed of, of all that belonged to him, and he uh, repaid me evil for good. May God do so, and more more also to David, if I leave all who belong to him, one male alive by morning. When uh, when Abigail saw David, she hastened and 
lighted off the donkey and fell before David on her face and did, did obeisance. Kneeling at his feet, she said, upon me alone, let this guilt be my Lord and let your handmaid, I pray you speak in your presence and hear the words of your handmaid. Let not my Lord, I pray you regard this foolish and wicked fellow Nabal for as his name is, so he is Nabal, foolish and wicked is his name and folly with him. But I, your handmaid, did not see my Lord's young men whom you sent. So now my Lord, as the Lord lives and as you see that the Lord has prevented you from blood guiltiness and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as noble. And now this guilt, uh, this gift rather, with uh, which your handmaid has brought my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Forgive, I pray you, the trespass of your handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the Lord's battles, and evil has not been found in all your days. Though man is risen up to pursue and to seek your life, yet the life of my Lord shall be bound in the living bundle with the Lord your God and the lives of your enemies, them shall he sling out as, as out of the center of the sling. And when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has promised concerning you and has made you ruler over Israel, there shall be no staggering grief to you or cause you pangs of conscience to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. And when the Lord has dealt with, uh, with my Lord, then honestly remember your handmaid. And David said to Abigail, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel who sent, who sent you this day to me and blessed be your discretion and advice and blessed be you who have kept today from blood, blood guiltiness and from avenging myself with my own hand. For the Lord, the God of Israel lives who has prevented me from hurting you. If you had not hurried and come to me uh, to meet me, surely by morning there will be not even been left so much as one male to Nabal. So David accepted what she said uh, she had brought him and said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have hearkened to your voice and I have granted your petition. And Abigail came to Nabal and behold, he was, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king and his heart was merry for he was very drunk. So she, 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 she told him nothing at all, all until morning light. But in the morning, when the wine uh, was gone out of Nebel and his wife told him these things, his heart died within him and he became paralyzed, helpless as a stone. And about 10 days after that, the Lord smote Nabal and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the, the cause of my reproach at the hand of Nabal and kept his servant from evil for the Lord has turned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head, and the Lord and David sent his commune, uh, and David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him as his wife. And when the servants of David had come to Abigail at, at Carmel, they said to her, "David sent us to you, to to you, to take you to him to be his wife." And she arose and bowed herself to the earth and said, "Behold." Let your handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of your servants, uh, the, uh, of my Lord. And Abigail hastened and arose and rode on, on a donkey with five of her hand, handmaids who followed her. And she went after the messengers of God, uh, of David rather, sorry, and became his wife. David also took um, I, 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 that name, Ahioniam of Jezreel, 
and they both became wives. Saul had given Michal, his daughter, David's wife, to faulty son of Laish, who was Galiam. Thank you, Sina Bishop. Amen. You are most welcome. Thank you so much. Yes, you can see there uh, this woman, Abigail, how she was a, a help in time of need. Eh? <laughs> when her husband was the true definition of submit to your what? Idiot husbands. Eh? So this man was really idiot, and even his name was called foolish. Idiot. And the wife came to the rescue so that his entire family was not destroyed. So you see the restraining there that she stepped in and uh, saved literally the entire household while the head was uh, busy, drunk, and uh, fighting against David. So you can see that now being manifested there, a practical example of, the, of God's help in the flesh. And then you have uh, Zipporah. Then you have Zipporah and, uh, <clears throat> and Moses in the book of Exodus, chapter 4. Um, Exodus, chapter 4. Let us just go there quickly. Verse 24 to 26. Who would like to read for us? Exodus, chapter 4, verse 24 to verse 26. You see another restrainer there. God almost killed somebody. Who would like to read? Exodus chapter 24. Oh. Chapter 4, verse, verse 24. 20, 24 to 26. The Bible says, At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zebora took a flame knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Amen. Thank you so much. This is one of those scriptures that, uh, that used to uh, trouble me. <laughs> that used to trouble me a lot. Uh, but it, it almost makes sense now. <clears throat> the role, you can see the role that Zipporah uh, was playing there. As, of course, the restrainer there. Uh, and and the help that Moses needed there uh, to keep him from being destroyed by the wrath of God because he failed to circumcise his son. Amen. Very powerful. Uh, and then we also see uh, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1, we see... Um, the role of another powerful helper there. Uh, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1 says, the wise woman builds her house. That's very powerful, isn't it? So there is, there is so much the Lord has embedded in the woman that is the helper suitable for her husband. Suitable to fellowship with him. Amen. Hallelujah. Is everybody in course? Uh, does anybody want to add to this before, I, before we move on from this uh, verse of uh, from this uh, passage of scripture? Amen. Amen. Yes, please. Yes. Um, I just wanted to add um one more. Thing about um, this aspect of um, a woman, or rather, uh, I mean, the couple being suitable. So, yes. in, in um, like like we like in the beginning when you were we were reading Genesis, there's the aspect of suitability. So, a lot of us we just we are used to this contemporary or modern world where we just go ahead and say, oh, yes, um, Sister Mary is, is so beautiful and um, Brother Joseph is so handsome. So you just jump on to the bandwagon and go ahead and 
mm-hmm. and uh, find that, I ha- that there are lots of pitfalls ahead. So what I was um, noticing from all these uh, conversations or, you know, like passages that we're reading in the different chapters is that the Lord has actually created somebody or individuals who are suited for a specific individual. As a man, um, you cannot be able to, okay, you you do have your, your power, you're powerful, and you do have your pitfalls. As the woman comes in to step in to give you that second thought, mm. there is that specific woman who can be able to carry out that role, not just any woman. Because the, the the other woman might be different, might be suitable for a different man. Yes. Mary might be better for for uh, Joseph, not not good enough for Paul or for Peter. But um, also Joseph is is going to only be able to listen or to react comfortably with what Mary is trying to bring forth. And some and and also when I. Uh, when we're reading this stuff, I can understand or I can see, um, visualize that um, sometimes the woman's role is not just to step in there with the mouth and say, oh, um, Joseph, you know, this and that, but actually she can act, she can act out and step in for the man so that she can avert a problem or an aspect of, uh, you know, like him going ahead of himself to bring an is an issue into the family so that's my contribution thank you amen thank you so much very powerful contribution there indeed <clears throat> that's why we now need to um to, to follow the lord's leadership so that uh we do not just go for anybody yeah as you said there the, the issue of suitability um yes there is that that you cannot just uh go with <clears throat> marry anybody yeah, it has to be uh, according to the Lord's leading and direction for the for that purpose that He has that He has set there, that He may <clears throat> make you suitable for a particular special somebody according to His plan, according to His purpose, uh, because of the glory of God that He wants to achieve in you. Amen. Very much indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that contribution. And is anybody else? Who wants to contribute before we transition? Before we transition. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm Nathan, Pastor Nathan. Yes, please, you're most welcome. I find this scripture, Proverbs 14, verse 1, is very rich and very wealthy. Amen. The wise woman builds a whole house but with our own hands the foolish one tears are down so this scripture is speaking to the current church actually to the current body of christ and also to the current couples that may be engaged that are married and also you find that there is so much things that happen in marriage at the present time many crises and so this scripture on my own understanding, the understanding of my in this context, the wise woman builds her own house. Meaning she cannot just go gossiping about the weaknesses of the husband. Meaning she knows how to conduct herself. She knows how to build her own house. She is not there to scatter or to destroy it. Yes. She's like a strength. I think that's how I see it. She, she doesn't, she doesn't scatter. She doesn't squander. Like to finish the the husband, she's there to build her own house, a house that is God fearing, uh, uh, something of that kind. She is not there just to, I don't know how to put it, but she's a woman who is wise. She's prayerful. Uh, she's intelligent. She doesn't conduct herself in a manner that is awkward. Yeah, that's how I understand it. And I think she's also there to assist the man to achieve God's blueprint. Because when God was creating man at the garden, there was so much role that was bestowed upon man. And there was so much to achieve and to take care of. 
And so the Lord, when he took the woman as a suitable helper, was she was there also to help man achieve God's mandate, uh, to take care of God's creation, to recreate, to fill the earth, and to raise for the only offspring uh, that will worship Jehovah. I think that that was the mind blueprint of God also providing a suitable helper for man, that they may raise for the God-fearing generations to come, that they may worship Jehovah God, to build for the nations that are God-fearing. Because from man and coming of the woman, then the nations began to, there was procreation. Yeah, thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Nathan. Indeed, and that, that now brings into perspective the... Um, the, 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 the fellowship part of the, of the, of the marriage relationship uh, to achieve uh, God's purpose and, uh, and God's command for the man and the woman uh, to rule and reign together. That uh, the wise woman then in that, in that union, ruling and reigning, you see the wisdom becomes a very central part to ensure that she does not stutter. Yeah, of course, the man also needs wisdom, but now we are just talking about this, this helper, God's help in the flesh, full of wisdom, um, that she should be wise. And, and part of this wisdom is to ensure that she does not expose her husband's nakedness. You know, the nakedness can be in many ways, not just the physical nakedness, but there's also the spiritual nakedness. And, uh, and when the man does embarrassing things like, uh, like Nabal, embarrassed himself there. Uh, so she's supposed to protect the nakedness in order to build her house because if you're exposing your nakedness out there and you're exposing your, the skeletons in your house there or the problems of your house to every passerby, then uh, you're not building your house, you're just tearing it down. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Nathan Patrick for that very powerful contribution. Uh, I think we still have some time to go and uh, would like us to shift gear and, uh, and talk about um, reasons why people get married. Okay. Can we explore that? And then uh, looking at uh, taking personal responsibility on this journey of marriage preparation. Amen? What do you think? Why do you want to get married? Or why do people out there, let's start with people out there. Uh, why do most people want to get married? Why do they get married? Please feel free to Open your mic and speak. Hallelujah. I'm sure you can all hear me. Let's talk about reasons why people get married. Hallelujah, blessed uh, Senior Bishop. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pastor Susan. Uh, Pastor Susan Elizabeth, can I speak? Yes, please, you may speak. Thank you so much. Uh, there are a number of reasons why people get married. And uh, I think here yeah, we are not specific. Uh, we are looking at it from uh, different, uh, different uh, from that uh, two points two views uh, one from the world yes. and another one from i think from the church uh -huh. so from from the church uh, the church side mm -hmm. we get married uh, according to the scriptures mm -hmm. apostle paul said uh, let me get it right that it's better for uh, for us to get married than uh, somebody burning with lust or with the flesh and saying I'll not get married. 
in the book of is it first Corinthians? Let me confirm, or somebody can confirm for me there. It says that we should get married. Yes, uh, first Corinthians chapter seven, verse uh, verse one onward. If you read the whole chapter, it's talking about married life. So people get married. It's good to get married so that you don't burn with lust in your flesh or you don't allow the flesh to take over because all of us, you know, you reach a certain level as a woman or a man when you should get married unless you have that gift of being, uh, unless if you're gifted by God not to get married. If you're a eunuch, if you're not a eunuch for the Lord, then you should get married. So we get married not to burn with lust but to get married and be in your marriage and be a married woman or a married man. Uh, secondly, even the Lord himself saw that uh, it's not good for a man to be alone. So that's why after creating Adam, he had to go ahead and create uh, Eve. He made him sleep and took away the rib from him and created Eve for him so that he can be complete. I believe if somebody lives a life without marriage, like you're born to you die 40 or 60 or 100 years when you've not gotten married, unless if you're a eunuch for the Lord and you've been called purposely for that, unless you have that calling, your life cannot be perfect without a partner. It's, we, if we, have, we just have to get married because God created a man and then besides that, he gave him a partner, a helper. So we get married because it's God made. Adam could not be alone. God brought up Eve for him. And uh, as I say that there are many reasons. Some people get married because they just they are those who just want company. But that is in the in the outside the church. In church, you cannot just come because you want company, and then you you become a if you just come but for you, you just want company, time will come when maybe you're tired of it and then you're going to mess up the marriage. You, the sister or the brother who came in with such a motive, you're going to mess up and you're going to make that marriage hell instead of uh, heaven or preparing for heaven. You're going to make it a, a, a scenario preparing for hell and it will be terrible instead of preparing for heaven. Thank you, thank you so much. Amen. I can end there for other people to contribute. Thank you so much. Amen. Uh, Brother Samuel, you want to say something? Samuel? Yes. Amen. Yes, praise the Lord. Blessed Bishop. Yes. Amen. Uh, also, okay, I don't want to contribute on that, why people want to get married. Mm -hmm. But I also had a question which is also related to that. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may ask, you may ask the question. Yeah, I wanted to know, like, how should I know or how must I know that I'm ready to, for, for, for marriage? Amen. Uh -huh. How should I know I'm ready for marriage? Okay. Yeah. Is that, is that the only question you have? Yeah, that is the only question I had. Thank you. All right. Um, we had uh, wrestled with this question before, but uh, we don't mind repeating. Repetition is the mother of all learning. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> how do I know that I am ready for marriage? Okay. Uh, as, as I prepare to, to answer your question, let me just read uh, two messages that were posted here. Um, okay, Sister Blessing, you can, if it's difficult, the Telegram is still running. Uh, you can connect on Telegram if it's difficult to connect on Zoom. Um, Sister Meke is saying people get married for companionship. Some they want, yes, they want company. Or companionship. Um, Sami says they want mutual support. Okay, for mutual support. 
according to Genesis 2.18, okay? All right, uh, it is not good for men to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Genesis 2.18. Thank you, sister. Make it for your contribution. Uh, and then the question is, how can I know that I am ready for marriage? Right. So this question is a very important question. And it must begin now, you must begin now asking yourself, am I ready? What does it mean to be ready for marriage? Right? What does it mean to be ready for marriage? And, and uh, there are different aspects to this, uh, to answering the question. Uh, how do you know? Before you know, how do you know? Of course, how do you know you are ready for marriage? First is to understand what does it mean to be ready uh, as a man, of course, and as a woman. Yeah? As a man, as a woman, what does it mean to be ready? And at the heart of this, the first question to understand is, do you understand the calling of marriage? Yeah. Do you understand what marriage is all about? Which, which, which brings into perspective what we are discussing now. Why do you want to get married? Yeah. Why are you entertaining the thought of getting married? Is it because um, you've, you, are, you are beginning to feel lonely or what? Is it because uh, you, are, you are getting bored with your life? And you think somebody, you need somebody to spice up your life? Why? Do, 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 what is marriage all about? And so understanding the basics of marriage, it is very important to have that. It, it, you, you will never be ready for marriage if you don't know what marriage is all about. The other, the other thing is, what, what does the Bible say about marriage? Of course, in understanding what marriage is all about, is understanding what is God's purpose and plan for marriage. What does the Bible say about marriage? Hallelujah. Of course, there are so many perspectives out there. Um, and, uh, and even the government now is trying to re redefine the, 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 the marriage institution. So what is marriage? What is your understanding of marriage? How much do you comprehend concerning the calling, concerning the purpose of marriage? And then you look at your spiritual, your spiritual maturity. Are you spiritually matured? Are you ready as a man now? As a man, are you ready? to take care of someone else's daughter. Yes, this is God's daughter that uh, whoever it is that you're getting married to, that is God's daughter. Are you ready to take care of her? And as a woman, are you ready to take care of God's son? Someone's son? Are you ready? Take care of someone's son. Are you self-centered or are you selfless? Do you want to enter marriage because of your selfish, self-centered reason? Are you just thinking about yourself? Me, 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 I want to be happy. Are you thinking only about yourself? Oh, I want to be happy. I'm lonely. I need, I need someone to spice up my life. <laughs> I need someone to complete me. What are your reasons? What, what, are, what, 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 what is your thought? Is it just about you? Are you self-centered? Hmm? Is it because of your self-centered reasons? Are you at that center? Are you the center of that universe called marriage that you're thinking about? Or are you thinking selflessly? Are you thinking of the glory of God? Are you thinking of selfless love? Greater love has no man than this. Than one that, 
then that, that a man may lay down his life for his friends. Are you thinking about only yourself? Are you thinking about self-centered, selfish reasons for getting married? Or are you being selfless? Or are you thinking about God's plan, God's purpose, achieving God's will? Yeah? Are you seeking God's will to be done in your life? Hallelujah. Or are you trying to control the situation? You want to be in control of your life. You want to be in control of everything. Hallelujah. So these are all questions that come into perspective when you're asking yourself, am I ready for marriage? We're not even <clears throat> talking about the issue of money here. Yeah? Or the issue of the house here. We're just talking about your, your, yourself, your spiritual state here. Because you can have money. You can have a house. You can have a job. And still lack in all these things we are talking about here. And, and lack in spiritual maturity. And better would be a, a poor man who is spiritually mature than a rich man who is spiritually poor. Of course, there is poverty or there is poor in spirit that is exalted in the book of Matthew chapter 5. But then there is, there is this dilapidated spiritual state that cannot build a house. Yeah? thinking about that spiritual maturity, we are talking about the wisdom. Are you a wise man? Are you a man of wisdom? Are you seeking wisdom? Hallelujah. These are all questions now to put into perspective. Even before you think about, have you found somebody that you are, that you are, that you are praying about, that you are interested in getting married to? <clears throat> and, and then here is the other thing. Are you actively investing in preparing yourself for marriage? Are you actively investing in preparing yourself for marriage? Slash married life. And how much are you investing? Because we have a lot of people. We have a lot of people that they want to get married very quickly. They just want things to be done very fast. No self-control, no restraint. They don't want to wait. They don't want to go through the process. They just want to find a woman today, and then next week, we are already married. Find a brother today, next month, we are already married. They just want to enter marriage 140. Are you actively investing in preparing yourself for marriage? Here's the other one. Are you a responsible person? Hallelujah. I see some people writing here. Brother James is saying, according to me, you must have self-control. In other words, how will you handle the new person? Uh-huh. To identify yourself that you are ready for marriage, okay? So, Brother James O'Kell is talking about self-control, and indeed self-control plays a, a key role there. A key role in making sure that you have a good character. You must be ready to take responsibilities. That's it. Are you a responsible person? Or you want somebody, someone else to come and take care of your messes? <laughs> are you trying to sort out your life? Make, 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 uh, to ensure that you are responsible. You take responsibility. Responsibility for your actions. Responsibility for your words. Responsibility for your decisions. Taking responsibility for the consequences of the decisions that you have made. Responsibility for your life. Are you responsible enough to take care of somebody else? Scripture says if you cannot take care of uh, that which belongs to you, how can you take care of that which belongs to somebody else? If you cannot take care of the little, how can you take care of the much? If you cannot be trusted with a little, with a few things, how can you be trusted with much? Are you responsible? Can you be trusted with a few things? Can you be trusted with someone's heart? Can you be trusted with someone's future? Talking about responsibility. Sister Epiphania is adding here, you must be ready to be under someone's leadership. Submission, yeah? Obedience. 
You must be able to solve your own problems. You must be, you must not be bossy. <laughs> yes. Do you want someone to control? <laughs> Some people, they are itchy for control. They want to get married so that they can tell other people what to do. They want to tell other people what to do. They are itchy, itchy for control. Welcome all the people that have just joined. Uh, we have, uh, who's here? Loise Maina, you are welcome. Thank you for joining us. We also have Helia Enshiweda. We also have uh, Mary Matas Nobis, welcome, welcome. Maria Martin, I think I welcome to you before. Bea, I welcome to you. Catherine Deritu, Pastor Catherine, welcome back. Welcome, not welcome back, but welcome. Welcome. We hope to hear from you. Bea Adeline, you are welcome. Okay, you have been here. You went and you came back, so welcome back. All right. So those are the questions to ask yourself. So you, so, so to ensure, to ask yourself, I mean, to answer that question, are you, am I ready for marriage? How do I know I'm ready for marriage? Begin to ask yourself all these questions. Probe yourself. Uh, Sister Epiphania here continues by saying, uh, you must be humble. Humility is definitely. Hi. Humility is one of those key, key issues. You must be spiritually mature, definitely. You must be ready to accept your mistakes. Yes, a responsible person, somebody who owns their mistakes and willing to change. Hallelujah. So it's time to probe yourself. Now listen to this. Uh, there is a scripture in the book of uh, Thessalonians, not Thessalonians, but uh, Corinthians that say, let him who stand examine himself. So it's now time to, to, to self-examine. You examine yourself. Examine every aspect of your life. Are you a proud man? Why, are you getting, why do you want to get married? To show off to everybody? So these are all questions that you need to ask yourself. And then you look into the scriptures. As the book of James says. As the book of James says. Uh, where is that? Is that James chapter 5? It says, he that looks into the perfect law of, of the grace... Let's, look, let's go there to the book of James. So look at the scriptures and look at your character. Look at yourself. Look at your, yourself and measure up yourself against the, the Bible. How do I measure up? How do I measure up when I look at the scriptures? Does the scripture, when I read the scriptures, does it look like I'm reading my life there? Or does it look like I'm reading about some foreign people that are foreign to me? Does my life and the life of the Bible measure up? Yes. All that counts towards being ready for marriage. Because your character, the character that you have, that you have built, that you have uh, nurtured, that you are questioning here, is going to form part of that foundation of, of whether you're building your marriage on the right foundation or on the wrong foundation. That determines the kind of foundation on which you have built your life. The foundation on which you have built your life now can project, can project now to say, how far will this marriage that you are seeking go? How deep are your spiritual roots, your spiritual maturity? The deeper it is, the more assured you are of, your, of the success of your marriage. So your spiritual growth, your wisdom, these are things that, that will tell about your future. So somebody can literally look at how you are speaking to other people, how you are behaving. I can literally look at you, how you are behaving, how you are speaking, and I can tell whether you'll be able to succeed <laughs> marriage-wise or not, whether whether this kind of character that you are exhibiting now 
is one that will ensure success in marriage or is a red flag, big red flag that, uh, that, 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 that must stop you now so that you can begin to sort out your life and ensure that you are right. You're on the right path. Now, I'm not sure if uh, all these many words I've said have answered your question. Um, who was that that asked? Was that Nathan Patrick, Pastor Nathan? Or was it, who was it that had asked that question? How do I know I'm ready for marriage? Amen. Sorry. Praise the Lord, blessed Bishop. Amen. I mean, I'm not the one. Actually, I just wanted to say something that Pastor, I saw some Pastor Elizabeth had said. Yes, yes, please. Yes, I also, I wanted to contribute and say that also uh, somebody had asked a question about why do someone, why do people marry? Yes. Also, I think also to fulfill our righteousness, uh, to cut off the issue of lasting and all these things that come with him or the decay. I think it's another to fulfill our righteousness. Amen. I think that's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Thank you so much Pastor Nathan. And maybe it was Brother Samuel who asked that question. So we have uh, Lolita Dalmeida. You're welcome. Uh, Fane from Saudi. You're also welcome. Uh, who else came? All right. Now, uh, yes, so some reasons were given here. Um, companionship. Yes, the age is running out. Mutual support to fulfill all righteousness. Uh -huh. What other reasons? Not, not just people in the church, but even people out there. What, what, do other peop what reasons do other people give for getting married? For seeking marriage. I know there is a question there by Brother Othello. Brother Othello will get your question a bit, a bit later, don't worry. Yes, who's that? Let me also say, let me also contribute also and say others they marry for the sake of fulfilling their appetites, their evil desires. Mm -hmm. It's happening, it's very rampant in this age. Many people are getting into marriage to fill their sexual appetites. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. But praise the Lord. Amen. I mean, I think the other reason for marrying is uh, for reproduction, producing the kids. <laughs> yes, yeah, some people want children. <laughs> yeah. Some people get married because they want children. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and some some get married because they want yes inheritance. Yeah, you have inheritance of houses, inheritance of properties, other properties. You have inheritance of years, financial wealth. Yeah, you have inheritance of uh, some get married because they want a good status. Yeah, they want good socioeconomic status. Raising for the holy offspring, that's also another look for others. Yes, raise for. Uh -huh. So we are just looking at everything together and then we sort it out later. <laughs> uh huh. I uh, think if you're talking in regards to the people out there, some of them just want a family. Maybe they never had a family. Mm -hmm. So they want to have a family. Family they never had. Or just to have a family. Mm. Uh -huh. Some of them, they say, I want to, have, to meet my soulmate. <laughs> mm. I hear that a lot or I see it a lot. Yes. <laughs> so they <laughs> want to be completed. Exactly. Mm. They feel incomplete. Incomplete. Yes. What else can you think of? 
Somebody was running, laughing. Who was that? Is that uh, Saifi? That, that, that was me, senior bishop. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just learning. I'm just learning through the, the I'm going through the points. Yes. Yeah. But I think my point has already been mentioned, but I'll add one. Please, yes. In a few minutes. Please add. But sadly, you find some of these, these reasons are full in, in church people's head, in, people, in the head of Christians. They're in full in the head of Christians. Some, they just want to be happy. Yeah? They are so miserable in their life. They want happiness. And they believe they cannot achieve happiness until they get married. Hallelujah. Uh, some, they want to get married because um, cultural reasons, isn't it? Yeah. Where you go to the family gatherings and your auntie is like, ah, damn, time is clicking. Hmm? Have you seen anybody? You know, has, have you been found? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> exactly. I want grandchildren. Some mothers, they say, I want grandchildren. When am I going to get grandchildren? <laughs> My peers already have many grandchildren. <laughs> I tell them to adopt. <laughs> That's a good option too. <laughs> and uh, some get married because, uh, yes, pressure. Now we're talking about pressure now. Pressure from their peers or pressure from their families, pressure from their friends. You must get married, you must get married, you must get married. Almost make them go crazy, yeah? They can't rest. They can't have a conversation without hearing you must get married. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And then they decide, ah, maybe yes, maybe I should get married. And then disaster strikes now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where disaster strikes. <laughs> disaster strikes. Amen. All right, let's see. Some, they want um, visas. Hey, that is true. <laughs> You know, I think some of the people, um, I think before joining the ministry, mm -hmm. some people would just take chances, you know? Mm -hmm. They would, um, not even necessarily from the country you've come, come from, but rather from anywhere, because when you're outside, um, you meet people from different countries. Yes. And, um, I think when they realize that, you know, you have been there for such a long time, <clears throat> um, they try to gauge now how they can, you know, score you <laughs> and keep their stay a bit longer. <laughs> sad. Very sad. I actually saw somebody on YouTube. Um, he, he, he's a Christian, actually. And uh, um, per se, uh, he it was the title of the video was I prayed for an American wife, <laughs> and the way he was talking, so he went to the US and um, he was now looking for ways of how he can stay and not go back to Kenya. <laughs> and uh, he like the first option was pray, he was praying to God to get an American wife. Because he was like, he, he had many options. He was like, okay, you can pay somebody to marry. <laughs> so that, um, you know, but obviously that will be very dangerous. What kind of Christian is that? I know. I was thinking, how, how what, was that even a consideration? <laughs> the other one was. Poros, porosity of Christianity. Uh -huh. <laughs> so people, uh, people do crazy stuff. Very and sometimes you don't, you wouldn't even know if somebody really, in, like, real intention is that they love you. Um, 
or they have other motives? The, they, just, yep. they just want papers, you know? Uh, yes. <laughs> Very true, Sister Catherine, Pastor Kathy. Um, there are some, some contributions here by the sisters. There's, uh, someone said some people want to get married because they are lonely. They feel lonely. <laughs> <laughs> and some, uh, <laughs> they feel like marriage will, will solve their loneliness problem. Aye, aye. You see the way the devil has lied to us. Huh? Uh, and, uh, some, they want to avoid fornication or sexual immorality. But here's the issue. If you think marriage is going to solve your sexual immorality problem, you are wrong. Yeah. Is there somebody That's why we have infidelity in yeah, marriages. Well, so someone here struggling with pornography and you think once you get married, you'll stop pornography. Hi, who lied to you? <laughs> <laughs> huh? mm -hmm. Marriage will not <clears throat> solve your immorality problem. If you are immoral, you, you continue to be immoral in your marriage. Exactly. So you must sort out your immorality before you get married. In fact, if I, if I hear you, you, you are in such immorality and you want to get married next month, that's already a red flag. <laughs> red flag. In immorality. True, and, true. You, you, have, you, have a, you, you have impregnated somebody who's pregnant nine months and then... Uh, and then now you want to marry somebody else in the next two I, you are not ready for marriage some indeed indeed to glorify the Lord to glorify God the noble reason to get married to glorify the Lord the Lord God Almighty and uh, Lolita says some want to get married because they see it as an achievement or as a goal yeah, they have they have a they have they have a bucket list. Get married at 25. And so when they are 24, they are praying very hard. My 25th birthday is coming. I must get married. I must get married. <laughs> at 24, 24 years and six months, they are not yet married. I must get married. I must get married. Two months to go. Now they're in a relationship. They say, let us get married before my 25th birthday. <laughs> So they can look back and say, yeah, 25 years, I did get married. But not only that, there are other forms of, uh, <laughs> other ways of, of, of thinking eh? of marriage as an, as an achievement, not just getting married at 25, but um, also other thought patterns that look at marriage as a sort of achievement that they must have. Uh, Brother Samuel, you said you wanted to ask about something. What is that? Praise the Lord. Amen. I think you, you had mentioned it. Yes. Because, uh, okay, on the, on the point where somebody raised that uh, some people want to get married because they want to escape from the fornication. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay, that topic, eh? Yes. Uh, so indeed, uh, yeah. Yeah. the only thing that's... So I, I wanted to... Yes, yes. Sorry? Please continue. I wanted, to, I wanted to ask if that one can be the reason for someone to get married. But I, I don't think if it is a reason. <laughs> no, it is not. It does not solve anything. It's yeah, like, I think deliverance. It's like deliverance. trying to run away from the problem rather than addressing the problem. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, so getting married as a way to run away from immorality uh, does not solve the problem. You have to address the problem of fornication, of sexual immorality, of lust, of pornography. Once you address that, and you and, 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 and you overcome it, then you'll be ready to get married. 
Otherwise, you'll find yourself in your married, in your married home, and your wife is always complaining about your computer. Always complaining about you and looking at other women or looking at other men. So getting married does not solve the problem of immorality. All right, now let us look at this. Uh, these reasons again. Yeah. So you have the selfish reasons. Selfish reasons for getting married. To have a child, this is a selfish reason. And, and in fact, some people think that uh, you, you find, especially some women, they think to themselves, sadly, even in the church, even in the church, they think like this. I want to marry this man, but she doesn't know how to do it. And then she comes up with a thought. I know the best way to keep him. I know the best way to catch him and to keep him. <laughs> so she catches him through seduction. And then she allows herself to enter into sexual sin with him. On purpose in order to get pregnant. Thinking to herself that once she gets pregnant, once she falls pregnant, once she falls pregnant with him, then now she has got him. <laughs> now I got you. We are not going anywhere. I got you now. I will keep you right here. Some they think like that. Very wicked way of thinking. Eh? <laughs> well, it depends on what kind of man you get. <laughs> You might have true suffering from henceforth. I'm telling you. It's... <laughs> there, there is one more here. There is one. There are a few more reasons here. Some they want to get married because of the outward beauty. They say, for me, I just want to marry the most handsome men around. Others say, I just want to marry the most beautiful man, woman around. You just give me a beautiful woman, I'm ready to get married. <laughs> Some say, I want to, they want to marry somebody because of their talents. This guy has such wonderful talents and skills. Oh, others say, we have things in common. Some, they have been in relationship for six years, relationship for such a long time. And, uh, and now they, they feel like, ah, we've been here six years, then let's now get married since we have test driven each other. And I hear those is test driving, you know, because yeah, if he really wanted you, he would have asked you to marry them the very first time. Yeah. They test drive to check everything. But six years, he doesn't want to marry you. That is a waste of time. Even 10 years. That, yeah. is brutal. that is brutality. That is selfish. Very selfish. These people, they are very selfish. All right. <laughs> now, I want, to, I want us to go through this. Of course, our time is almost over. Um, excuse me. Just got a little bit distraction here. Um, so, so, there are, so you can group these reasons now into two categories. Isn't it? So you have the selfish reasons for getting married, and then you have the godly reasons for marriage. Yeah. Let's let's uh, let us try to sort out. Let us try to sort out. Let us see if we are on the same page. Wow, it's already 419 at this site. Okay. Um, let us see here. All right. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 says that it's better to marry than to burn with lust. Is that a good reason to marry? <laughs> now this is our discussion moment now. Is that a is that is that a no, excellent reason to marry? 
Amen, sister. Bless you. To me, I can say it's it's no. Mm-hmm. It's not the best reason. Good. Sister Blessing says no. That is not a good reason to get married. Uh huh. Sister Martha, do you want to add something there? Okay, who else? Pastor Silas. Overseer Feliciano. Feliciano, are you still there? I'm still here alive, uh, Blessed Bishop. And I believe yes. we've just discussed actually that, that point. You know, uh, whereby the burning of lust. Yes. Uh, I mean, Bishop said it loud and clear that it's uh, it's better you first address your problem, address the situation. Mm-hmm. Then uh, what? Then then only you can be ready, or then only you are ready for marriage. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Bishop highlighted it so much, and even made good examples there, yes. whereby you say that um, you can even be married there with your wife but you are just still on the computer you know spending hours on the computer yes. just looking at other women or even vice versa mm. yes <laughs> yes uh, you remember the mighty prophet was talking about to find some pastors they, so they are now on holiday with their wives and they go to the beach <laughs> and they go to the beach to rest to adihat for holiday and while they are there at the beach, rather than having, <laughs> rather than having a, a, a time of rest with their wives, they are just looking around and lusting after the women around here in, in, their, in their nudity. And they like going to the beach for that. Yeah? And so it will not solve your, your, your last problem if you are having, if you are struggling with lust immorality hallelujah and so sort that out address it hmm? how can you address sexual lust without marriage marriage is not for solving sexual lust problem now here's the question <clears throat> another question so so when you look at the nature of lust sexual lust that is an issue of lack of self control it's a, it's a character flaw. It's a, it's a spiritual depravity. <laughs> Sister Epiphania said, just imagine some, getting married to someone who just wants a visa or something. That would be a marriage nightmare, of course. That would be a nightmare marriage. Uh, <clears throat> lust, sexual lust, sexual sin. That is a, a character, <clears throat> a spiritual uh, problem. Yeah, The problem of the heart character flow. It is rooted in infatuation. Infatuation that we have discussed at the beginning of our, of our first, uh, of, our, of our fellowship back last year. Last is rooted in, 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 in um, the sensual desires of the flesh. It's rooted in lack of self-control. It is rooted in, 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 in want, wanting to fulfill the desire now, wanting to, to fulfill it and fulfill it right now, not tomorrow. Uh, it is spiritual indiscipline. Indiscipline. It is, um, what is the word? I was thinking of, um, um, just bear with me. So it's wanting to miss the sensual desires of the flesh, uh, lack of self-control, spiritual indiscipline, indeed, and it's uh, trying to meet the desires and to meet them right now. And it is also uh, wanting to obey, obey obedience to the flesh, obedience to the flesh, rather than obedience to the Holy Spirit. And so when you get married, you know, <laughs> some men, they think once they get married, then they are just going to have sex with their wife the whole day <laughs> and fulfill all their desires as much as they want. That whatever they want will just be on, uh, <laughs> provided on the platter. That is a serious misconception of marriage. 
if you are burning with lust and you're thinking of getting married so that you can <laughs> that's that's not what happens <laughs> okay <laughs> marriage is more <laughs> is more than sexual intimacy and you can have all the sexual intimacy you want and still have a miserable marriage if you are entering for marriage for, for the sake of fulfilling your sexual desires you can still end up you end up having a miserable marriage while you are having your, your sexual appetites being met but having a miserable marriage so marriage is not designed to solve the last problem so how can you address it before marriage repent from your immorality repent Ask the Lord to destroy that, that flesh in you, that devil called flesh in you. Just as everybody else has their sins dealt with by the blood of the Lamb. It is not marriage that will, that will redeem you. <laughs> it is not marriage that will redeem you. You need to deal with your, sex, with your sexual sin and repent before the Lord and ask the Lord to take it away. Wash you clean with his blood and take, the, take responsibility to address your character flaws, to address your, your foolishness, really. To address your lack of self-control, your weaknesses that lead you into immorality when you see somebody that is opposite sex. Yeah? Of course, these are things that must be dealt with before marriage, that can be dealt with before marriage. And there is no such thing that you can never solve uh, a last problem until you get married. It's not true. It's not true. You, you can definitely and you must sort it out. Now imagine now your wife is thinking to herself, I'm just a sex object to my husband. All he wants from me is sex, nothing else. Hey, that is terrible. You are married to your wife and your wife just knows that the only thing you're interested in is sexual intimacy. That is very selfish. Very sad. Very sad indeed. You have not even matured. There is no spiritual maturity there. Hallelujah. And so, and these are, and these are really the reasons why people are destroying them. Uh, people are divorcing left, right, and center. Because they get married thinking, wow, oh, now I'm going to enjoy all the sex I want. And then they get there and then they get the shock of their life. <laughs> they will be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> for life they get we call it disillusionment they get disillusioned yeah get disillusioned life does not marriage does not seem to work to, to turn out the way they expect it to be disappointed disillusioned destroyed crushed no peace at home because the expectation is not being met so no so you sort out the sexual lust problem the same way you sort out the lying problem. The, way, the same way uh, people must sort out the witchcraft problem, the apostasy problem. Okay, uh, companionship. To get married because you want a companion. Is that a good reason for marriage? Which, which, which side does it fall? On the side of uh, godly reasons for marriage? Or on the side of... Uh, I think godly reason of marriage. On the other side, selfish reasons. Mm -hmm. Mr. Catherine says uh, it's a godly reason to get married. Deliverance and breaking of soul ties must happen before marriage. Susan Bugwa says. Uh -huh. yes. yes. What do you say, blessed people? <clears throat> what do you say about this? About Which one? About, uh, Point three? Two. Two. You said it's a godly reason, but I wanted to hear other people if <clears throat> there's somebody who disagrees. Oh. 
Somebody's afraid, eh? Okay, number three. Pastor Nathan, do you want to say something? I also believe it's a, it's a good reason for companionship. Mm -hmm. It's a good reason. It's stated in the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. Chapter Genesis chapter what chapter one? Is Bishop Wung here? Where is Bishop Wung? Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Pastor Nathan, for your contribution there. Um, amen. Uh, what about number three? They have reached an age of getting married. I'm 18 years. I must get married now. I'm 20. I'm, I'm, I'm 30 years. I'm getting too old. I must get married. What do you think? What do you think of reason number three? To seek marriage. It's not a good enough reason. Not good enough, eh? Yeah. Good yeah. enough. It's it just mother. Yes. It's not. It's not, eh? That was mother. Yes. Uh -huh. <clears throat> it's not a good enough, yes. Um, it is better. Somebody said, I still remember what, uh, who was that? Pastor Meke said, better to wait long than to marry wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, Brother James says, age is not a big reason. Spiritual maturity is the most important. Um, yes. So age, uh, be, we need to be careful with age. Eh? So it is a wrong, it is wrong, it is selfish to think that uh, just because you are now 13, now you must get married. Now, uh, <clears throat> yes, period. Your age does not determine spirit, uh, marriage success. So being 40 years does not mean you have a successful marriage. Being 30 years old does not mean you have a successful marriage. Yeah? It's just a fact. You can be 40 years and still foolish and not ready for marriage. And when you get there, you just scatter everything. <laughs> Here is one thing that is very fascinating. When you look at 50, if you look at a person who's 50 years old getting married, sorry to say this, but they behave exactly the same way as a 20 year old who's getting married. <laughs> they just, they all follow the same pattern. And you begin to realize that being 50 does not give you an advantage except that you have more experience. Many things that a 20 year old did not have experience. But that experience, it takes wisdom to allow that experience to prepare you. Because some people can go through uh, very horrible experiences or very exciting experience and never learn anything. They can go through so much and they come out just. They change, their character has changed, but their wisdom here, they have not become wiser. Sometimes they just become more foolish with all their experience. Okay, uh, next, next one. Mutual support, according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Is that a good reason to get married? Absolutely not. <laughs> Pastor Catherine says, absolutely not. Elaborate. Hmm? Oh, so, you know, mutual support, so we share half the rent. <laughs> uh -huh. It makes life easy. No, that is not like a good enough reason to get married. You are saying a 50-50 marriage is not a good thing, eh? I even ha I had the man of God one time rebuking, you know, some people, <laughs> they do this, you know, so that you can split the rent or just make life a bit easier for yourselves. Um, they want 50-50. Yeah. 
You put half mm. and put half. <laughs> Might as well just move back with your parents, you know? <laughs> Very true. Or go and stay with your friends. <laughs> yeah. Somebody was laughing. Was that Sister Martha? Yeah. Who is it that was laughing about? Okay. Yes, 50-50. Is the, the recipe for disaster, as I like to say. And you still find many people thinking this is the best model. This is now where you find the prenuptial agreement issues. Eh? The issues of prenuptial agreement. I buy my house, but it still remains mine. You come with your car, it remains yours. I think okay. that's where the trust issue comes in. Yes. You don't even trust the other person. Why waste your energy and your effort to marry somebody that you don't trust? Imagine. <laughs> what kind of gambling is that? <laughs> gambling with their life, eh? Yeah. <laughs> that kind of person does not love their life. <laughs> you know, you go through the effort to go to the lawyer to write up a neutral agreement. Mm -hmm. But then, I don't know. It is just wicked. <laughs> getting, wicked. Married, getting married with a plan of divorce. <laughs> that is marrying one side, you are marrying the other side, you are already planning to divorce. <laughs> Is double minded entering marriage with a double mind, half. Yeah. One side in, one side out. Twenty five years, still half hearted. I wonder. You'd rather stay single. Yeah. Yeah. Then what's the use of getting married, rather? <laughs> the people they don't love their life. They just want more stress. <laughs> they want to. They think they are solving their problems by seeking 50-50. It's not seeking, it's, it does not solve problem at all. Just make things. And I was thinking about the prenatal agreement. Does it really also affect the children? Because if you have children. Uh, children, they always go to the court. So, uh, yeah. The, so basically, even if you have that prenatal agreement, you're still going to give something. <laughs> yeah. Just that the, 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 I, I guess the prenuptial agreement ensures that the other person does not have a stake in their business, <laughs> does not have a stake in their affairs. So it's, it's a really horrible way to live with another human being. Yeah. But you want to be so close to, you want to be so close, but so far. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how, it, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, you must go fully in. When you're getting married, you must go there with a the mindset of, I give my all. Do it right. But just keep my shamba on the side. <laughs> They're getting married, but then they have a secret house in the village. Secret house. The husband knows. Why the house. village? Who wants to? Oh. Know? <laughs> well, the secret house. Yeah, they, are, they are in London, they have a secret house in Birmingham. Or. Oh, <laughs> And in Vintuk, they have a secret house in Oshakati. So th they said, I bought it before we got married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they did not disclose. They don't want to disclose it because they're afraid that they disclose, then this man is just going to eat up all the rent money. Oh. <laughs> then why, why, why do you want to marry the first, this person in the first place? You think they're going to eat up your rent money? Uh, yeah, yeah, just just tell them I don't trust you. Um, it can't work out. Mm. <laughs> so so it's, it's it's a waste of time. People don't. I love you, but I don't love you that much. Yeah, inferiority complex. Issues, 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 issues. Trying to test if it will work. Mm. Um. So. When you get in, go in 100% and give 1,000% effort. Just give your all. Self-abandoned. 
But you see, the flesh is very, very much careful. Does not want to, does not want to give everything just in case things may fall. <laughs> that, that is why we must invest in premarital, uh, in, the, in our premarital stage, in our single in stage of st singleness. Yeah, that's why you must invest a lot to ensure that you do everything all right. That this is the right person. So that you never wake, you never get married as if somebody woke you up to marry them. <clears throat> you get married not knowing what you are doing. So you must go in 100% and uh, you must give your all. No me, no, no me, no, this is mine, this is yours, but only us. Can two walk together unless they agree? So you must be in full, total agreement. And remember, yeah. Marriage is, is a mirror of the relationship between Christ and the church. Is there such a thing as Christ says that uh, he, he, he has saved you, but he has not saved you? <laughs> <laughs> then we'd all be going to hell. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you. Because Christ gave his all that, we, that he may take us. So now if he says, I've died for you, but I've not really died for you. So... I want you to come to heaven, but I don't really want you because I don't want you to come near my throne. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. It's, um, those are gam gam gambling games that the Lord does not play. To fulfill all righteousness. Was that Pastor Nathan who mentioned this point? To fulfill all righteousness. What do, we, what do you think? Is this a good reason to get married? To fulfill righteousness? Of course. <laughs> yes. This is a no-brainer. And Blessed Bishop, uh, just to add on that as well, why people get married. I think some, you know, as Ephesians 5, uh, 25 says that husbands love your wives um, just as Christ uh, loved the church and gave himself up for her. Yes. Some people probably just want to experience giving that love, you know, and that love, this, that type of love, you can only give to your spouse, to your wife, you cannot give it to your sister, you cannot give it to your friend, to anybody but to your wife, you know, so they probably just want to experience that, how it feels like mm -hmm. to love someone so much as Christ loves the church. Mm. We ought to love, we ought to do that. We ought to follow the example of Christ. It is an obligation. It is a command. It is a requirement. It is an expectation of Christ that we lay down our lives for our spouses. Amen. The selfless, mm -hmm. the selflessness. We need to enter marriage selfless. Ready to give up your all for the other person. The Yes, must be ready. Some of us here, you don't want to die for, for the other person that you're getting married. You're thinking of getting married, but you're like, ah, do I really want to die for somebody? If I die, then they, they continue living. <laughs> but you know, in what sense do you mean dying? <laughs> no, I mean dying. I really mean dying. What? How Jump dying? In front Jump of in bullet. front of Jump in bullet. <laughs> Die, yes. die, die in the place. Die, die, you know, when, 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 when it comes to that, that you must really be willing to die. Go to heaven while they remain here. <laughs> you, know, it, you know, you have to put it in context. Um, what is it? You know, because when you, okay, we understand dying, yes. but not that... Um, What's it? What is it called? Not that you should die physically. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how to put it into context, but um, yes, you should be willing to die for the other person. I struggled with this same question of, am I really ready, willing to die? For my wife, you know, before marriage now, am I really willing to die for somebody? You know, the way we love ourselves, we love our lives, we love our future. 
we love our vocations, we love whatever we, we, we are doing. You want to study, you want to achieve A, B, C, D, and now to think of, you must be ready to die for somebody, to give up, to consider, to consider that person better than yourself, to consider that person's interest higher than yourself. Yeah. But you must have shown this um, before even getting married because it's not just going to happen when you get into marriage. No. It, it will take a process to learn it. If you don't, if you don't have that, that mindset before marriage, then it will, it will take a, a process to, to, to learn that lesson and to internalize it and to own it and to embrace it. But if you don't embrace it, uh, someone who's not ready to die for you, of course, that's somebody who, who, who's willing, who will be ready to walk away from you, isn't it? They will be ready to sell, to sell you off for the sake of their peace, for the sake of their safety, for the sake of their, of their salvation from whatever threat that will be coming your way. So yes, something that we must be um, that we must embrace <laughs> before yes. marriage, so that when marriage marriage life when married when time for marriage comes, then you are always on alert. You are yeah, always to execute duty. <laughs> when duty calls, you are ready. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, robber comes, for example. But I'm, I'm, I'm ready to take a bullet on your behalf. Do you know, <laughs> I, had one, I had that one example of um, a, a lady, actually, who it happened to. They were in their home and um, robbers came. Yeah. Their father ran away through the back door <laughs> and left the back of the house. You know, because they were in like a really um, rich area in Nairobi, <laughs> and um, the the husband just snuck out. I'm like, what kind of a ruthless man is this? So he was willing to sacrifice his family and for him to get away. Yeah, whereas, yeah. yeah, you know, they they were the family was in the house. It's only by the you know the grace of God that they you know. They did not get harmed, but the robbers are coming and then you are running, you're sneaking out of the house, leaving the family inside the house. Uh -huh. Rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> that man loves his life too much, more than his family. So the, his, his life is more precious than the family. I think that's when you wake up. Like if you find that he can, somebody can do that to you, you're like, ah, no, this. Is... But you see, the children are older now. It's not like we've just yeah. gotten married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then you realize somebody can do that to you instead of kind of alerting you. Either you can hide or go with him. Yeah. We call that Captain Coward, yeah. Mm. That is Captain Coward now. Who's ready to tuck tail and run? While the wife and children are being brutalized. Oh, time is uh, running here. Yeah? Okay, I think we can continue this. Some of uh, discussing some of the other, the other reasons at another time. Sister Martha is asking, <clears throat> if I do not get married, does that mean I'm not fulfilling all righteousness? Absolutely not. Hmm. Explain it. How about I even like you know what the Lord says. Uh, um, I, I remember I, that what's that scripture where it says um for those who stay um what was the word for the ones who stay unmarried will even have a greater reward. Um, that is in the book of Isaiah 50, Isaiah, is that 54? Says, There's another one actually, even in the New Testament where Jesus said it. I, uh, he talked about the eunuchs. He says, yes, yes, gosh. That was the one I was trying to find in my head. <laughs> the eunuchs, you know, so the eunuchs are not, they're not getting married, but they'll even have a better share. 
in heaven and be married. Revelation, Revelation, the book of Revelation. I saw another one. It's not even in the Revelation. Um, and then somebody was asking. First Corinthians seven, is it? Mm, I don't know. Let me check. No. Um, see, you find that uh, in the book of uh, Matthew, he says that uh, Peter said, "Then it is better not to marry," because Jesus was saying that uh, if anybody divorces a woman, except sexual immorality, he commits adultery with her. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And uh, Peter said, was it Peter or someone? He said, oh, then it's better not to marry. Oh, yes, I think that's the one. And then the Lord said, but it, no, it has not been given to everyone. So I remember even there's a time I was feeling that way. I was like, do I really actually want to get married? <laughs> Uh -huh. but um yes um answering Martha's question it's um it's even better to stay without marriage if you know if you are able to yes yeah if you're able to you have not sinned this is not a sin so this is just to say that getting married to fulfill righteousness yeah to seek righteousness because marriage has a special place in the heart of God so yes there are those that will never get married and there are those that will get married either way you have not sinned if you marry you have not sinned if you don't marry you have not sinned those that marry are not more righteous than those that don't marry <laughs> but they get better rewards remember in Daniel I think it's Daniel 12 Because I remember even um, the radio team discussing of how the men of God asked specific people not to marry. Uh, oh, please, please, pardon, Pastor. Sorry? Saying, Senior Bishop, mm. uh, uh, Pastor said something and I didn't get it well, so I was requesting her to pardon it up. Pastor Catherine. Oh, there are some people who are asked by the men of God not to marry and just do the mission of the Lord. I know many. <laughs> they will not be mentioned here. They already mentioned themselves on the radio. <laughs> they mentioned themselves. Okay, please. The radio team, the office team, there's some people uh, around Kenya. Uh -huh. um, they are eunuchs. They are eunuchs for the Lord. They, they, the Lord said, no man should ever touch you. Just focus on the mission of the Lord. And the Lord will reward you. That is the that is the yeah, instruction when, of the Lord now. That is the instruction of yeah, the Lord. Yeah, when when for that case now, uh, if Senior Bishop may allow me, please. For that case, I think that is the Lord's calling. But there's this notion also that some youth say they claim they claim to be eunuchs or set apart. But then down the line, you hear of, I know so many. Down the line, they change the decision and then they fall. Not just changing, changing, changing decision, but they fall fast. Now you like, what happened again along the way? You said you are for the Lord. You see, and at the same time, Paul writing to the Corinthians church, led by the Holy Spirit, he said that this way is free will. That nobody, uh, uh, I mean, it's a free will thing. So if you can, you can also manage. By the way, depends on your schedule. How you're seeking the Lord to be fasting prayers, I mean, just in his presence. Like for them, like what Pastor Catherine is saying, there's a different case. The Lord calls them to that. And he will sustain them because he called them and he will establish his word to make to ensure they stand for his name. But the notion that they used to only say, oh, I'm set apart, and then all of a sudden they fall, they fall, shaming the Lord really, is really saddening and breaking their hearts. Thank you. In actual fact, the Bible says, um, oh my gosh, if I could just find that scripture. It says, and those who want to also 
the Lord is able to keep them. Yeah. But also you cannot be divided in saying today, I want in tomorrow. The, you are changing yeah. your decision. <laughs> Maybe you yeah, can but... Maybe, Yeah. So the Lord says, you know, for those who are willing, like, because the, even the way the Lord said, it's not for everyone, but those who, you know, Yes. Those who are willing, because it is a personal decision. Nobody can enforce it on you. Yes. Because you're the one who's going to live it. You're going to live that life of purity. So, yes. so the one yeah, who the, is okay. because they are not, they have not committed to that decision. They are wavering between two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's to answer <laughs> Martha's question. Yes, it's possible. <laughs> and um, it is a personal choice also. And there's those who are called to it also. Amen. Done. Matthew chapter 19, verse, 20, verse 12. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I was just thinking, I was like, I read it somewhere. <laughs> Can you see it there on the screen? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. There are eunuchs who have been sold from birth. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. Oh, that's a, but there are those that are born eunuchs. There are those mm. made by men. Mm. And then there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, I like the last part. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. Yeah. So it is possible. But you just have to be really seeking the Lord. You cannot be, you know. You know, doing it because you want to look cool. <laughs> I know one, one of the pastors here, when he was a university lecturer, <clears throat> born again, university lecturer, he said, he, he had made people know that he's not going to get married. He's a eunuch. And uh, then lo and behold, after some time, he's getting married. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe let's just say he was keeping himself pure <laughs> until the appointed time. It was different case, you know. <laughs> so, so it happens that some people they want to to, to be eunuchs, especially, and I, I I don't know why, but especially a lot of women uh, in their twenties, somewhere mid twenties, there some women they feel like they'll never get married until they reach close to their thirties, and then they change their mind. I think. Oh, I want to and so have you seen your bishop? Yeah. Uh, there's a uh, on the point that we're just talking about, there is a, a scenario that happened in this side of Africa. Um, there was a lady that just wedded well in the ministry with um, a powerful young man. And so along the way, they lived for like seven years or so. But what shocked me when I called the young man to come help me do some work somewhere. He gave me a sad story. That, but we know that right now I'm single. When I asked what happened, uh, the parents influenced the lady and the lady um, divorced him. And so she went and married another guy. And like that. So that story really shocked me. And this really, no, let me just stop it at that point. Anyway. I just wanted to, 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 I mean, to support what Senior Bishop was saying. That is how I brought that story. It really shocked me. So I was wondering how, how did that happen, really? Yeah, you mean you marry in church, and then along the way things happen. So I don't know what happened. No, the other day, okay, it's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> I don't think I even understood. <laughs> He's talking about um, somebody from, is he from the ministry who got married? But then he's wife... senior bishop. Let me let me let me come up again so that Pastor Catherine may hear what I'm trying to say on the point that uh, senior bishop was explaining to us uh, that things do happen along the way. Like we talked about along the way, you find these people married in the ministry and then they stayed for like seven to eight years, and then the ladies they decided to call it uh, a stop, and then. Went and went and married married somebody else outside the ministry. So I was trying to wonder how, <laughs> you know. Oh. But that case is different. Now she became a she backslided. But then it's really tricky. Just so asking myself: Is this man now allowed to?
that is my question to the senior bishop. Is this man now allowed to remarry again? Yeah, that is my question. Because the Bible says that, yeah, when you divorce, you stay like that. So let me hear advice concerning that. Amen. So we are round, rounding up now. The time is really over. Uh, let me, I, will, I will answer that question. Somebody that got married and then uh, the wife left him. So what of him now? Should he remain single? Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, there is a there is a, a comment from Sister Angie. Sister Angie is still here. Uh, she says sometimes our society has pushed and convinced us to remain eunuchs. But then she's asking, but why be a eunuch and languish in lust? Yeah. Uh, sometimes we make premature decisions, uninformed decisions. And uh, we decide to, <clears throat> to try being a eunuch. But then uh, it's not your gift. It's not your gift. Or it's just an influence from uh, the outside world. And you think, I think this is cool. Let me try it out. It will solve all my problems. But then you don't have the gift. You don't have the grace to be a eunuch. Mm -hmm. So indeed, you have to, uh, don't, don't try something that is not yours. <laughs> Just be patient. If nobody is approaching you for marriage, just be patient. Don't declare now that, oh, five years I've been waiting, therefore now I become a eunuch. Don't make such vows. <laughs> Don't make such vows that you cannot keep before the Lord. The, 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 the King Solomon said, why make a foolish vow before the Lord? You require it from you. So let us be careful. There's somebody, I will not mention who, obviously, they even wrote an email and say they want to be a eunuch. And then, you know, it didn't even take long. They wrote it and a few months later they got married. I was like, yes. you just yes. made a vow to the Lord and then you broke it within months. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, if you're not sure, just take time, pray about it no. before you start making vows no. about... Um, something and then you change like you literally change your mind a few months later are you it's a shock <laughs> yeah yeah what 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 you're saying has happened to a lot of worshipers very many i know more than 10 like one was told i'm not going to mention names but i'm just saying this that it may help somebody one went before the lord and some of us were privileged to be in that meeting and the lord just said the two prophets said that my daughter, we see us doing a powerful wedding for you. And the lady detested before the Lord, no, not me. Owing to the fact that earlier on, she'd say that she set apart for the Lord. And Mark Q, it didn't even stay long. Three, three to four months down the line, when all the supports were withdrawn, this lady was frustrated and she ended up <laughs> being wedded. So it's like, you mean, the Lord saw it and then he detested. So what happened along the way? So many of them, another one said, oh, they, they set apart, what, what, what? And then you hear the story of immorality. It shocks you. It shocks you until you say, hey, and Jesus died. Is this still happening? You know? So sometimes I always say, pray according to the Lord's will and seek wisdom, seek advice before you make some decisions. Don't just be, uh, when, oh, sorry for saying, for talking in Swahili. <laughs> Sometimes when you're fasting so much, <laughs> you feel like, no, I'm just in heaven, which is okay. But then along that, you make tough decisions. And then later along the line, down the line, you find yourself breaching the, um, the promises that you already made. And that re requires serious repentance. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord, blessed Bishop. Maybe also I can chip in also a little bit. Yes, you'll be the last one, and then we'll wrap it up. I think the calling to be a eunuch is a very serious calling. Mm -hmm. And before someone makes a decision like that one, they have to they have to be very sober and to seek the Lord very seriously. Uh, being a eunuch, it requires a lot of sacrifice. There is so much that you, you are disconnected from. There is so much separation. Uh, and when the Lord calls you, he's also able to 
give you the forbearance and to take you through the calling. But you'll find that most of the people in the ministry, somebody just wants to put them to call themselves, not the Lord himself calling them to the calling of eunuch, but they just want to put themselves in that category, am I eunuch? And then along the way, they disappoint the Lord. I think that's a very dangerous thing. And it's, it's very bad because that's a foolish vow. And the Lord will not tolerate it. It's, it's terrible, if I can say. Very terrible. Indeed, Pastor Nathan, that is a foolish vow, a hasty vow, and it must be made, I like what you said, with soberness of spirit. You must be sober. You don't make it after you've been disappointed in a relationship. You don't make it <laughs> because nobody wants to accept you. You don't make it because uh, you feel spiritually dry. You make it soberly after you have really sought the Lord and, uh, and, and really get the, that grace. Um, really get that grace. It's a special grace. Very serious uh, <clears throat> spiritual state before the Lord. And must never be made in haste without uh, the Lord himself leading you that direction. It even happens to those people who have put in their mind they want to get married and the lord calls you and he says no <laughs> that's, that's it. so it's just it, you really have to seek the lord definitely and now there is this question that was posted by sister Esther blessing we are going to end with this i just want to recognize somebody that joined us uh pastor Ndahafa, johanna who else joined us recently some people left eh? all right um, there's a question by Sister Esther Blessing that she asked last week and we didn't get to address it. How About, long was the meeting? Sorry, before you answer that question. Sorry? How long was this meeting? Three hours. Um, Three hours now. Six minutes. Seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I see you're counting the minutes. <laughs> The meeting is so powerful. I, I, I wish it could it could continue. The, the, uh, by the grace of God, we'll meet again soon. But for now, we are here. Let's use this few minutes. We still have a few minutes, I mean. So Sister Esther Blessing is asking about divorcing if your husband or wife commits sexual immorality. So, uh, sister, is the blessing? Are you asking? Are you asking if it is allowed to divorce if your husband, if a husband or wife commits sexual immorality? Or... Now, if that is the question, here is my take. The Bible is very clear, isn't it? The book of the Bible says in the book of uh, Matthew, chapter nineteen, from verse four to verse um, twelve, talks about marriage. It says. Uh, the Pharisees, they came to the Lord Jesus and they asked him, is it lawful? Okay, let me go to that scripture. Let me read it very well. The, the topic of divorce is always a very interesting topic. Eh? And a very sensitive one too. Yeah. Very sensitive topic. Very. When you're close to some people, you, you want to make sure that you don't speak too fast. <laughs> <laughs> and you can every word that comes from your mouth because they are paying attention to everything. You know, some of us grew up in devastated homes, isn't it? Our parents were divorced. This is true. Some of us, our fathers, they were married three times before they married your mother. Ouch. And then after that, they go and marry somebody else. And they have children all over the place. Mm. <laughs> so how do you pray? Do you say, Lord, I pray, I wish my father has not divorced my mother. <laughs> but you see, what one thing I've realized is like if you, it's like those ones who have two wives. If that person gets born again, they will have to leave. Definitely. Definitely. No matter how long you have been together. Yeah, polygamy is not scriptural. Mm. Of course, we see all these. Uh, Look at in a bishop. Yeah. 
I was asking um, that question based on that scripture that I've just posted. Okay. Yes, and I just found Matthew 19, it. verse 9. Amen. Yes, it's the one I was looking for. It's the one I was looking for. Now I found it. Now I found it. Thank you so much. But it is. Uh, I want us to look at the context. Uh, I hope I can finish this in the next five minutes. So I want us to look at the context so that we, we see where Jesus has arrived. Amen. And then after that, we'll go to the book of uh, Romans chapter. Romans chapter 6, I think. <clears throat> okay. So, the, so the, the Pharisees, they came storming. I don't know where they found Jesus at this time, but there was a large crowd there. And it was in Galilee, okay, on the other side of the Jordan. So they came storming with their long phylacteries and their long prayer shawls and straight face, and they're asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now, why were they asking? They were asking, but they already had an answer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. they, they, they are the kind of people that, that they don't want an answer from you. They just want to debate you. They were so evil. <laughs> Every time. So, so they are coming with an answer to trap you. Is it lawful? Because now the law, now you are referring to Moses. Now is it lawful? Now is referring to the, to the Pentateuch. Uh, Genesis, um, Exodus. Um, what's the other one? Leviticus. Numbers and Deuteronomy. So they are referring to these five books. So according to the law, according to the five books of Moses, is it right for a man to divorce his wife? For any, now look at that. For any and every reason. This really encompass everything that could ever come into your mind. Isn't it? <laughs> they are really encapsulating everything. Mm. For, for, for children, children issues, house issues, sexual immorality, whatever you can fit under that any and every reason. Basically, when you get tired of your wife, I'm out. <laughs> Even including that. <laughs> so for any and every. So, and then he asked them, have you not read? Look at his answer now. Now, when he answers them, he refers back to Genesis that we read earlier. Huh? Have you not read that at the beginning, the creator made Adam and Eve and said, for this reason, Adam will leave his father and mother and be united to Eve, and the two will become one flesh? Have you not read? That is the answer of the Lord Jesus. When he, when he heard the question, any and every, he says, but go back to Genesis. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Now he brings out the gravity of this spiritual union, of this covenant, of this marriage covenant. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So this is Jesus' answer to the initial question, to the first question. Any and every reason. Now, a lot of things fit under any and every eh? A lot of things fit there. Very scary reasons also. Very sobering answer here. They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. I guess this is one of the most difficult answers the church has dealt with. Yeah? Because if, if, you, if you go into some of our churches here, you would find the pastor's assistant is divorced. Men in this department, heading this department has been divorced. The other one here. So it's so commonplace, especially today. So commonplace. Divorce is so commonplace. And the marriage covenant has been, has been, um, has, uh, now appears to be as a simple thing that can easily be broken. And that's because the beginning how we enter into this marriage covenant, it's so casually. People just enter this marriage covenant so casually without fear. You know, the other time we were talking about, we were talking about brokenness, how you must tremble before you enter marriage. 
the seriousness of the covenant, all that pride that you are entering, they are entering with so much pride. And now they find themselves asking, so can I divorce? Can I divorce? They have not, they have not honored the covenant before they entered. But the Lord is saying, but God's plan, God's purpose, God's initial design for marriage is such that the man and his wife, they become one flesh before the Lord. And what God has put together, has joined together, let no one separate. Meaning no one has the authority to separate. Not the lawyer, not the judge, not your father, not your mother, not yourself. <laughs> not your children, not your job. That's a very heavy answer. But then they probed, they pushed further. They say, no, we are not satisfied. Because they already have the answer in their mind. They have an answer that they wanted. That they wanted Jesus to confirm. Why then, they asked, did, did Moses command that a man can give he commanded a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away. So why? Now, you know Moses. Moses had a lot of authority. Moses is very authoritative. Yeah? Moses is a very powerful prophet. We have them now. Yes, we have Moses right here. Yes. So it's not a joke when you talk about Moses. Yeah. When he speaks his, his command, it is law. You don't debate. So why? This very powerful prophet in whose seat we are now, because they sat in the seat of Moses. Why did he say we can just get some papyrus, go to some lawyer with a, and get a nice paper with a nice uh, coat of arm here and the stamp here and a few letters written there, the irreconcilable differences, whatever, and some nice leaves here, and we stamp it. Now, this is a certificate of divorce. So why did Moses say we can do that? And then Jesus answered. Now look at the answer of Jesus. He said, what is the problem now? Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. Look at that. But it was not this way from the beginning. Again, he reiterates himself. Marriage is very serious before the Lord. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts are hard. Faithlessness. Now he says there is an issue of faith here. Hardened hearts. Lack of faith. Lack of belief. Lack of trust in the Lord. Lack of trust in the Lord. A stiff-necked, uh, hard heart is a stiff-necked heart. Stiff-necked person who just wants to do things their way. And so Moses said, okay, Jen, then go ahead. If that's what you want, then go ahead into your destruction and, uh, and destroy yourself. You know, sometimes eh, we, want, we want certain things from the Lord, and the Lord does not want us to get them. But we keep pushing and pushing and pushing until the Lord says, then go ahead. Isn't it? That's a terrible mm -hmm. place to be. When God says, okay, go ahead now and destroy yourself. You're finished. That, that is a very dangerous place to be. So he says that the hardness of heart, so they could not be convinced. They could, these are people that are so difficult to handle. In the wilderness, because they said they are stiff-necked people. God says, do this. They do the opposite, the exact opposite. <laughs> 40 years with the Lord in the wilderness, and the cloud is leading them day in and day out. The cloud lifts, they follow. The cloud settles, they settle. But when the cloud says, do this, they refuse to do. They refuse. They, are, they, they just want to do things their own way. But the Lord says, but that's not the way it was in the beginning. The Lord just let them to go on with their hardness of heart. He said, okay, continue with your hardness. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Right? Now he raises the standard now. Yeah? Anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another man, another woman commits adultery. 
So there are two ways to look at this. Of course, you can look at it and say, oh yeah, Jesus said, it's fine, we can divorce. But Jesus was not telling us how far you can push the boundaries. I don't think the Lord Jesus here was telling us how far you can push the boundaries and, you know, to, 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 to overcome this. It was not so in the beginning. He was saying that is very clear, except for sexual immorality. If there's sexual immorality, yes, one can divorce, right? Just a moment, don't be so quick. But he says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman, he commits adultery. So he's saying, divorcing your wife, marry somebody else in the eyes of the Lord before the courts of heaven, that is adultery. But now look, now look at this. He talks about divorcing your wife here because of uh, divorcing somebody because of immorality, except because it's, it's like he gives a leeway of sexual immorality here. But then in another place, he says, whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery with her. Look at that. Can somebody help me with that scripture? Is it in Luke or is it in Matthew? see if I can find it. Whoever marries a woman um, where is that scripture? Maybe Pastor Nathan can help me out or Sister Nderi too. Do you remember where that scripture is? It says whoever marries uh, whoever divorces, whoever marries a divorced woman, he commits adultery with her. Let me see if I can find it here. So we read it together. And so we remember it together. And then, now, having said that, yeah, having presented that scenario now, he said, all right, except for sexual immorality, it's adultery. Then he says, but whoever is going to marry this woman will be committing immorality. And the same, I believe, applies for the men. Yeah, that whoever marries a whoever marries a divorced man commits adultery. Ah, the bar is very high. Eh? Yes, yes, Sister Esther. While I look for this, uh, blessed Bishop, I believe. Did you find the scripture? No, I did not find it yet. I see it's in the book of. Is it the one in the book of uh, Luke? Luke uh, sixteen, uh, verse eighteen. Yes, that's the one I was looking for. Thank you. I'm going there right now. Yes, sister, it's a blessing. You can ask uh, in the meantime while I go to that scripture. Yes, Bishop, I just wanted to put up out what I understood in that scripture. Mm -hmm. Because it says that whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So to me, I understand that if you divorce your wife, because of sexual immorality and you marry another, then you don't commit adultery. Because they said except for this, and you marry another, you commit adultery. But if it is for sexual immorality, then uh, and, and you divorce and you marry another, I, uh, you, then you don't commit adultery. That's how I understood. Uh -huh. Now, I just want to, uh, good. Now, uh, that, that is one way to look at it, yeah? But I don't think um, the Lord wants us to, to jump so quickly to such a conclusion. Yeah. Uh, and indeed, there's a lot of immorality today. Of course, there's a lot of immorality. <laughs> very rampant. Yeah. Very, very rampant. Uh, uh, here is the scripture. Marriage is very, very honorable before the Lord. Um, and uh, has high value. Whoever divorces or dismisses and repudiates his wife and marries another commits adultery. Look at that now. So there he says, except for immorality, divorce your wife, you commit adultery. But now look at here. Look at this one now. Now this one now gives you a different perspective. He says, whoever divorces his wife, maybe for immorality, maybe for the, maybe for the sake of um, for the reason of immorality, yeah? 
It says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman, the one who divorces the wife commits adultery. Look at that. Do you see that? And then he says, and he who marries a woman who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Hey. So that's like a double whammy. So both of them are <laughs> adultery. This is very sobering. Eh? Now, so you look at that. You look at that. The, the, the two scriptures now. Matthew uh, um, 19. And then Luke chapter 16 verse 18. Then you go to Malachi. With that in mind now, then go to Malachi. Right? Then go to Malachi chapter 2. We start from verse 13. <clears throat> then you start from <laughs> the people of Israel. Look from verse 13 here. Malachi, are you this? Can you see, sister? That's the blessing. Malachi chapter 2 from verse 13. Can you see this? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Can I read? Yes, 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 yes. Let me just put bigger. Screen. Okay, there we go. Malachi chapter 2, verse 13. To 16. Yes. The Bible says, okay. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accept them with pleasure from your hands. To ask, why? Is, it is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Unfaithful, yeah? That unfaithful has, is, is the, the immorality part there. Mm -hmm. Continue, please. Has, hasn't the Lord... As not the one God made you, you belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the law and what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. You see that? It says be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. Do not be immoral. <laughs> He's rebuking the sin of unfaithfulness here. And unfaithfulness includes, includes that uh, sexual immorality. He says do not be unfaithful and protect your wife. Guard your marriage. So God's instruction for marriage is not Okay, divorce. Okay, at least, okay, it's immorality to divorce. The Lord calls us to stop being unfaithful and to pursue the goodness of our marriage. In another place, now, uh, <laughs> I thought it would take me five minutes to answer this question, but now it's 28 minutes. Eh? <laughs> Let me see. If you I should know by amen, now. Amen, amen. <laughs> what you start takes long to finish. <laughs> It is very powerful. <laughs> I just want to make sure that uh, no, nobody goes away misunderstanding me or misunderstanding the scriptures because uh, uh, we have to get a, a proper context. Yeah. And fear also. When it comes to marriage, I fear. You must fear. When it comes to marriage, you must really fear the Lord and tremble. So you don't you don't just you don't you don't just jump to tell people to divorce. No no no. That one, I you don't run to do that. Um. <laughs> it is indeed very true, blessed bishop. Uh, uh, because these are very sensitive. I believe it's a very 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 sensitive topic, and uh, it will be said just to 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 to, to be left, um, mm -hmm. what unquenched. Mm. If I can say that. Yes. Look here, it says, divorce does violence. It says, you do violence. Now, look, 
uh, is that uh, Amplified? Let me read it from the Amplified. Look at Amplified. NIV does not uh, bring out this, uh, this part that Amplified brings out. I think King James also. Look there, um, verse uh, 16. For the, for the Lord, the God of Israel says, I hate divorce and marital separation. And him who covers his gum, who covers his garment, his wife with violence. Look at that. He, he does not even say divorce for what reason. He says, I hate divorce. So the Lord makes his position very clear. <laughs> oh, but you said, indeed, we have read in Matthew chapter 19. But as I was saying, he was not saying that, from my point of view, I think he was not saying that to say, okay, here's, a, here's how far you can push the boundaries with, when it comes to this topic. He was just, of course, he was giving us a, a, matter, of, a, a matter of fact, that except for adultery, you, 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 you commit, uh, except for, for, for the immorality, you commit adultery. But then you look at Luke 16, 18, and he says, you divorce your wife, you commit adultery. You, if somebody marries, if you marry somebody else, you commit adultery. So now you must fear and tremble now. So I think the thing is to be pure and to avoid immorality at all. Yes. And when you bring in, in, in uh, okay, chapter two, now he says, I had divorce. Now from here, I want to transition now to the book of, uh, of, of Ezekiel. <clears throat> somebody will also help me find this scripture. Uh, now, in Ezekiel, he said, <laughs> I think in one, one place he said, now, look at this. When you look at the book of uh, Hosea, now the Lord now <clears throat> puts himself into our shoes. Now the Lord puts himself into our shoes. He says, I am your husband, and Israel now takes the place of the wife of God, as the church is the wife of Christ. So, he says now his prophet uh, Amos should take his place and see how he feels. See how God feels about you when you commit adultery against the Lord. When you commit sexual sin against the Lord. He gave us now a vivid example of what it means to be in God's place. Or God puts himself in our place whereby now God is the husband and uh, he, he, having his wife. So what does God do when his wife commits adultery on him? When God, when his wife commits sexual sin against him, what do you see happening in the book of Hosea? He says, go and get, go and get married to Goma, this prostitute. The prophet goes and gets married to the prostitute. Then the Lord said, look, the house of Israel, Goma, that is the house of Israel. And then she left him. She goes and she prostitutes herself with a lot of men. A lot of men. Hmm? And then when she prostitutes herself, the Lord says to his prophet, he did not say, ah, just divorce her. He said, go and get her. Yeah, go, go and get her. Go and get her back to show us what he himself does. That's what God does now when he is in that situation. Commit immorality, eh? Okay, go and get her back. <laughs> Fight for that woman. Fight for that marriage. Fight for that man. Ah, unconditional love we're talking about here. Go and get her back. She came back. And then she went back again <laughs> into immorality. <laughs> and the Lord said, no. Go back and get her again. The Lord does not say divorce her. He said going back. In fact, now, he found her on the marketplace. Now she was selling herself. The man with the, high, the highest bid that takes her. Hey, what, is, what a place to be in in a marriage. Eh? <laughs> the wife is at the marketplace selling herself. He said, pay, 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 her, pay to get her back. Pay. Give your money. Your wife. Hey. Pay, pay, pay. Let her come home. And he paid and she came home. Now, then you go to the book of Ezekiel now. When you go to the book of Ezekiel, now the Lord now, he, he describes greater details. 
in one part, I don't know whether it is the book of Ezekiel or the book of Jeremiah, he said, show me the certificate of divorce that I have given to you, to, to, to your mother. <laughs> Despite the immorality, she has raised altars on, under every tree. Under every tree, there is idol worship, sexual immorality. Show me the certificate of divorce. Hallelujah. And then, then he begins to describe. He said, ah, look, the way I found you, and I washed you, hmm? and I provided for you everything. This is now in the book of Ezekiel. But you went and prostituted yourself into immorality. And then the Lord said, then the Lord said, but you see, now you are a special kind of prostitute <laughs> describing Israel. You're a special kind of prostitute because other prostitutes, they sell themselves. The man pays him, pays her to sleep with him. To sleep with her. I, sorry. The man pays the woman to sleep with her. Eh? But for Israel, she goes and looks for the man and he and she pays her. She pays. <laughs> Say, this is the kind of prostitute who pays her clients <laughs> rather than the clients paying her. <laughs> this one is a different kind of, uh, uh, of, of immorality now. But the Lord went and fought for her. They say, No, I will not give up on you. That's why I'm saying the Lord Jesus is not giving us Matthew 19, verse 18, or verse 20, to give us an opportunity to divorce. If there's anything the Lord has demonstrated to us, is fight for that man, fight for that woman, fight for that marriage. Yeah. yeah. Go and buy it. If she's selling herself for the market, go and get it. Fight for that marriage. Hallelujah. Amen. Just don't get divorced at all, is what I'm no. getting uh, from this. <laughs> Your first divorce must not be, I must divorce. No, that must not be the yes, first. The thing I've picked mm -hmm. is that the Lord hates divorce. Yes. Uh, he says, hates it. Yes. He hates it. Because he himself, look now, we went, look at us now. We went into all manner of, idol of, of idolatry and adultery, but he sent Christ Jesus to die for us while we were yet in our sins. Look at that. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that is what he wants the man to do for the wife. While we were yet sinners, not while we were yet righteous. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, I was just saying a, a scenario, like let's say like uh, you were a man or a, a woman. Um, just in the reference to Luke uh, 16. And this, this woman happened to be divorced or this woman, or this man happened to be divorced and you marry that person and you find out that uh, they were already in a relationship. So what will happen to you now? Because if you say, if you marry that person, you're also committing adultery. No, 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 my only question is this, you know, th that's already one big, how can you get married to somebody you didn't know that this person was married? Uh, this is <laughs> because that is the first question I will ask you. Was this woman married before? Before when you come to me? When you come to me, our time is running here. Eh? Sister Blessing, please keep this some of these questions for the next week because we'll not finish off. <laughs> <laughs> you started too early, Bishop. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just wrap up this one and then we finish. <laughs> I hope we have another meeting this week, this coming week. <laughs> I hope soon we'll have another one. So, so here is the thing. That my first question to you, if you want to get married, when you come to me, I'll ask you, was this person married before? Is this person divorced? Is this person having a children? So these are basic things. You, you cannot tell me that Oh, only later on did you find out that she was divorced. Hey, you are putting yourself in trouble. You see, the Lord mentioned a scenario like this in the Bible. He said, a man divorces, then he marries another woman, and then later on he divorced her to go back to his first wife. The Lord calls oh, oh. that abomination. So yeah. these are the kind of confusion that we are creating ourselves when the Lord has not told us to go down that way. 
we, 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 when you're now going to these games, you're marrying somebody who was divorced. Now you're asking, is it now a sin if I divorced her because she was already divorced? Maybe I should just divorce her to go back. This is the kind of entanglement you're putting yourself in, a problem you could have avoided. The Lord does not give us prescription for some of these things because that was not the Lord's design in the beginning, that you, you divorce, that the person divorced, and that you go and marry someone who's divorced. Mm. And so just do your due diligence. Make sure you don't marry somebody who's divorced. Now, if you find yourself counseling somebody who was divorced, may the Lord give you grace to help such people. <laughs> <laughs> But for you now, you are not yet married. Please don't go and marry somebody who's divorced. <laughs> hmm? Unless if you hear my husband died, maybe that will give you a breather. <laughs> but even then, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so our time is really out. I, I want to continue. We're having a wonderful time. But um, I have 20 minutes before the marriage fellowship. And uh, I, I, I <clears throat> Need to re rejuvenate my my strength, amen. Um, I, I'm not even going to ask for somebody to give last last say. Let me look for someone to pray here. Who prayed for us last time? Um, me. You pray. <laughs> and and uh, who prayed today? Who prayed for us today? Was Sister Angie? Eh? Was it Angie who prayed today? I will ask Sister Blessing, Esther Blessing, to pray. Yes, please. Esther Blessing, please pray for us. I think I had asked you to pray, to pray at the beginning and there was an issue. Yeah, now, now it's your turn to pray again. If you don't... Amen. Yes, okay, thank you. Let us pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you and we bless your name, my God. We thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for this powerful meeting, my Father. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you have given us, my Lord. And we thank you for allowing the Senior Bishop even to come to us today. We thank you, my Lord, because you've been so gracious unto us. And thank you for teaching us many of the things about marriage that, Lord, have helped build most of us. Jehovah, we repent of every evil thought, of every word we have spoken. We does not glorify your name. And then we give you glory and honor. And we ask you to help each one of us in our weaknesses. And continue to strengthen us, my Lord, that we may walk in absolute holiness and righteousness, even as and, uh, we anticipate for the glorious coming of the Messiah. And may you, Lord, satisfy all our heart desires according to your will. And may you protect each one, each and every one of us, even as we leave this meeting, my Lord, that you may protect and keep us until next time when we shall meet, my Father. We will glorify your name and we will bless you, Jesus. Father, I thank you and I worship you and I ask you to be with us all and may your grace and your love be with us. In Jesus' mighty name I pray and believe. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Amen. 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 And uh, thank you, Pastor Nathan Patrick, for, for, for fellowshipping with us today. I think it was your first time eh, with us. And there was also Pastor Susan Elizabeth. Thank you so much, blessed senior bishop. Amen. It has been a pleasure. So Thank you very much. Learned. Bless the senior bishop. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Amen. Uh, Pastor Catherine, thank you. We have a lot of pastors today here. Bless your Jacob. Uh, Sister Angie, are you also one of the pastors? Thank you. Amen. Um, <laughs> it's coming in the making soon. Amen. My title, my title as per now stands as Pastor Elect. Pastor Elect. Oh, there we go now. Pastor Elect. Um, I will have to I will have to ask your permission to to leave the meeting because I've been awake for 24 hours now. Yes, we are done now. We are totally done. You are free to go. Please go and rest. Amen. Thank you. Pastor Silas and everybody, Day Adeline, Pastor Michael, Pastor Saki, Pastor Martha, Pastor Johanna. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Who else is here? Amen. Thank you for hosting a senior bishop. Final remarks. 
Susan Bugwa and uh, Payne and let's see, I don't want to leave everybody out, anybody out. Thank you. The Lord bless you. Shalom. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Shalom. 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 I'm, I'm ending it now. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs>